Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Professor Blechman's memorial session, which is called Vibration in Science and Technology. Uh, my name is Alexander Fiedlin from the Karlsruhe uh, Institute of Technology in Germany, and I was asked to chair this session. We have some troubles uh, because Professor Indetsov could not attend the meeting via Zoom. Uh, he will try to get some help. And uh, we will start with the first presentation by Professor uh, Fratkov. Uh, the title of his talk is Vibration and Control, inspired by Ilya Israelovich Blechman. Uh, before uh, you are going to start, I would like to thank you very much for uh, the organization of this uh, special session. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, can you hear me? I can uh, hear you. And uh, can you see my yes. uh, screen? Yes. See. With, with, with the portrait of uh, Professor Blechman. Okay. So, make it full screen. Uh, just a moment. Now, now it is better. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, uh, give a talk at this uh, unique uh, session um, organized uh, by uh, several people to commemorate um, uh, great achievements and uh, uh, great personality of uh, Professor Ilya Zaj Blechman. Uh, I would like to uh, make several, um, uh, to present you several ideas uh, related to our collaboration with uh, Ilya Israelish, with, uh, which continued for about a quarter of a century, 25 years. Uh, it started uh, with a meeting with COS, and I will be speaking about uh, synchronization, uh, control of vibrations, and so on and so far. Our uh, first uh, joint research was um, um, was um, in the framework of the uh, European project INTAS in the mid uh, 90s. Uh, we uh, visited together uh, Holland. Uh, our uh, colleague, uh, Professor Hank Nemeyer, um, at that time he was uh, living and working in the University of Twente in Schede. And the University of Twente is a very nice university. It is located in the forests and the fields. And uh, uh, great number of cows uh, were walking around uh, the campus. So we were sitting at the hill and uh, looking uh, at the coast, at the nature, and there were nothing but uh, sky, coast, science, uh, no administration, no government, no uh, publications, no scopus, only uh, sky, coast, and science. It was so inspiring. We uh, were speaking about interesting things. I have learned a lot from him. And we started our collaboration at that time uh, jointly with uh, Professor Nemeyer, you can see him uh, in the restaurant in Enschede in Holland. And um, we have published joint paper with, uh, um, just a minute, uh, Professor Nindesov is uh, calling, let me do Я, я уже делаю доклад. So, uh, the problems with uh, uh, connection for Professor Indesif are not solved yet, but hopefully they will be solved. 
So uh, during uh, our visit, we uh, prepared a new uh, general definition of, uh, of uh, synchronization. There were many special definitions and uh, interest in synchronization at that time was uh, tremendous. And uh, we uh, made a new <clears throat> formulation, a very general one, uh, encompassing both uh, self-synchronization and the controlled synchronization. Because uh, we are, Neymar and uh, Pogromsky and me, we are from control area. And it was very interesting to uh, publish, to prepare a paper um, related to both mechanics and control. And this paper uh, has become very popular. It's uh, got more than 200 citations in uh, Scopus. It, uh, actually, it's actually um, the most cited paper by uh, Professor Blechman. And uh, uh, the definition we prepare is uh, related to uh, several criteria of synchronization uh, defined by uh, some functionals and uh, 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 identical, identical uh, equality to zero sum functionals is a criteria of synchronization in a, a multiple uh, interconnected dynamical systems. And also in this paper, there was a, a definition of controlled synchronization with respect to the same functionals, uh, which uh, ex differs from the first one in that relation that it is uh, connected to uh, design, to synthesis, rather than analysis. And the problem of control is uh, to find the feedbacks, uh, the feedback function of the states or maybe of outputs, um, allowing to uh, achieve synchronization. It is convenient to combine uh, several functionals into one, uh, some G of or Q, the criterion, the single criterion of synchronization, and then um, uh, we can uh, reformulate the problem of synthesis as a problem of minimizing this uh, combined functional. And it's a very constructive, very powerful way. Um, and uh, in along this road, we uh, passed uh, to formulation and uh, design of uh, control synchronization for vibrational uh, units. And it was published in the next paper, next joint paper uh, in the uh, year 2002. It was uh, also, it has become also very popular, more than 1000 citations in Scopus. And uh, we started um, solve different problems uh, related to uh, controlled synchronization. And uh, typical uh, vibrational units with two uh, rotors, two unbalanced rotors, uh, can be uh, the mathematical model uh, with uh, inputs and outputs. Inputs are controlling torques. And the problem of control is to find the lows, feedback lows, how to change control talks in order to achieve synchronization. And uh, using uh, our method related in my, uh, designed in my group uh, long ago, so-called uh, speed gradient method, um, based on the um, whole functional, whole functional uh, expressing um, some uh, uh, some uh, quality uh, indic uh, index of quality of synchronization. Uh, we may uh, evaluate its uh, derivative along trajectories of the controlled systems, uh, Q dot, and then uh, based on this uh, Q dot, evaluating the gradient of the speed, uh, we arrived uh, at the control um, low for control of vibration units of both rotors. And uh, this idea uh, was exploited by us uh, many times later. 
and uh, we we are interested in uh, experimental um, verification of this idea and um, there was that time we uh, have found some amount of money uh, there was joint uh, grant called uh, uh, integration at that time and um, as a result of the setup vibrational mechatronic setup was created with two rotors and uh, some publications were some papers were published expressing this <clears throat> uh, results obtained experimentally uh, this is uh, uh, the mechanical part uh, is uh, very uh, similar to those uh, st uh, setups made by Blechman's group for many years ago but uh, the new what was new is a um, computer control uh, computer and uh, other communication facilities which uh, made a new quality of this uh, uh, unit it is a mechatronic unit however it was not very powerful we were able to solve only some problems there and uh, nevertheless we have published a book uh, with uh, many co-authors uh, working together from different universities this was probably the first book in russian in uh, control of mechatronic vibrational units and uh, i would like to mention several uh, problems uh, solved in this book theoretically and uh, by simulation and only later we were able to solve them uh, experimentally so uh, the first is uh, startup mode control of startup mode of the uh, setup uh, its idea mm, was inspired by uh, works uh, of uh, professor blackman related to capizza pendulum and uh, uh, capizza pendulum classical capizza pendulum is a um, uh, is a mechanical system controlled by a periodical um, uh, input by a, um, a vibrational input and it uh, was uh, well studied and extended to a full branch of mechanics vibrational mechanics by Blechman in several uh, publications several books and uh, um, what we were doing we introduced feedback and considered uh, controlled uh, or feedback capizza pendulum using speed gradient methods uh, we designed the control algorithm and this algorithm allowed to um, achieve uh, stabilization of the uh, upright unstable equilibrium by means of arbitrarily small uh, control arbitrarily small um, input of course if uh, we neglect uh, friction here under friction we can evaluate the required uh, intensity of control uh, the next problem uh, was related to control of passage through resonance zone and uh, for a simplest uh, vibra actuator with a single uh, rotor a balanced rotor uh, equations are simple relatively simple and control uh, algorithm is uh, also very simple is uh, just like in the for um, capizza pendulum and it was checked experimentally the that and it worked perfectly we were very happy and uh, for passage through resonance uh, um, control we were not able to experiment make experiments there only theoretically we uh, checked this and uh, um, by uh, computer simulation and uh, what is interesting uh, the left picture uh, shows uh, the uncontrolled case uh, for smaller intensity of, of input we uh, can observe a Sommerfeld phenomenon Sommerfeld effect and a small increase of uh, input uh, allows to pass through resonance and for control proposed control algorithm we can pass through resonance zone uh, with smaller value of uh, gamma uh, control intensity input intensity so it looked like it worked um, and we have many publications um, 
related to different cases, uh, one or two uh, degree of freedoms um, uh, systems. But uh, Brechman was interested, got interested in uh, the uh, mechanism, how this passage through resonance works. And he was very excited uh, with this problem. And he discussed this with uh, the professor in dates of, uh, and with me also. And uh, he actually uh, prepared the formulation, the solution to this problem, explanation why it uh, happens. And uh, in initial uh, part of this uh, result of this um, uh, study uh, was uh, based on standard approach uh, by uh, method, uh, Blechman's methods of uh, direct separation of motion. However, uh, the, uh, I pass through this, the first approximation is just Zomerfeld uh, effect and uh, there is nothing new here. But what was new here that uh, Blechman invented second approximation and which allowed to describe the semi-slow oscillation of the rotor. It, uh, he called it uh, internal pendulum. And um, he not only uh, formulated equations for uh, this motion, but also these are equations, but also he evaluated the frequency of this motion. And it, uh, for me, it's a fantastic result because these motions are not uh, persistent. Uh, these uh, oscillations are decaying. So not easy to find the motion of decaying oscillations. And uh, we, uh, this is the reason why many people did not observe uh, these uh, semi-slow oscillations. And uh, it allowed to explain uh, this um, <clears throat> picture, this picture, and uh, during this oscillation, when we cannot uh, pass through resonance uh, due to Sommerfeld effect, uh, the f frequency of this oscillation is very close to those evaluated by Blechman. And uh, this is uh, new, uh, very, very strong result uh, this formula uh, is very new and i suggest uh, to call this uh, frequency the blechman frequency we already used this term in a couple of our publications so um much later uh, in the mid of uh, second decade of this century we uh, managed to got some uh, additional amount of money and create a new generation of vibration setup. In um, uh, 2019, this you can see here, it has additional degree of freedom here, uh, which allows to extend uh, power, for, power of this um, uh, setup and uh, made new interesting experiments. We have done that, we made uh, finally, uh, passage through resonance experiments uh, with experimental setup. And now I would like to pass to conclusion. Probably it's time to pass. Uh, I showed you only a few examples uh, of uh, influence of uh, Professor Blechman to um, uh, many areas around him, many scientific areas. He was actually a very broad-minded uh, person and his inspiring power was tremendous. His inspiration and intellectual generosity was very important for people around him, for all of us. And uh, some example, one uh, example related to cybernetical physics, study of physical systems by cybernetical means, which I am working uh, on for uh, more than two decades since, since the end of the 90s. And actually, it was uh, Blechman who inspired me to work uh, on it. He said, oh, you, uh, it looks like uh, you created a new branch of science. OK. Um, and the second example, uh, how he influenced um, 
to, uh, on all of us. Um, Capitza pendulum now is very popular. Uh, the, here you can see a picture of a, a schoolboy uh, from uh, Lyceum. He is uh, 12 years old. He created uh, Capitza pendulum by himself from Lego. Uh, from Lego, and um, it works. Uh, I don't have time to show you video, but it works. And um, it was very nice uh, uh, story uh, when we celebrated uh, 80th uh, anniversary of uh, Ilya Israelovich in Ipmash, uh, uh, Ipme, where uh, we have created with uh, school children uh, not only Capitza Pendulum, but also a uh, two rotor vibrational setup, which worked right uh, in the room. And uh, uh, here you can see a nice uh, picture. And let me stop at this uh, moment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Fratkov. Are there any questions or comments? If there are no questions or comments, you can simply speak if you want to. I would like, unfortunately, to give some, to contradict you a little bit. Uh, because uh, these semi-slow oscillations were not found by Blackman. Semi-slow oscillations were found by Anatoly Nystadt in the 70s. He was a, a scholar of uh, Vladimir Arnold and is now professor at Loughborough University in the UK. Uh, he's a mathematician. And Blechmann's attention to these semi-slow vibrations was uh, attracted by his uh, scholar Alexei Pechenev, who uh, has wrote several papers on this equivalent internal pendulum and um, semi-slow oscillations uh, in the 80s. So uh, it's a large tradition of the mathematical analysis of uh, passage of um, weakly damped system, uh, systems uh, through resonance, uh, both coming from pure mathematicians like Arnold and uh, Nystadt, uh, and also from Blechmann's own scholars. Anatoly Pechenev unfortunately died several years ago. He was only... Uh, 57. Mm. May, may I also make a comment on your comment? Sure. Yeah. Um, your, um, uh, I agree with, um, how to say, you um, are correct when you mentioned these names. And uh, in our uh, papers, uh, we refer to the papers by um, Neistat and uh, Pechenev. But uh, I should say that um, in the papers by Neistat, uh, the results uh, were very uh, general, yes. and it's not um, easy to uh, adapt them uh, to this uh, special uh, situation. In the Pechenev's papers, uh, the results for, were for this case, but very, you know, um, the formulas are were cumbersome. Maybe the uh, have uh, good accuracy, better accuracy, but uh, they are not easy to apply. And um, I uh, read uh, papers by Neistat and uh, um, uh, Pechenev also. There were also papers uh, by American uh, uh, researchers, uh, Queen uh, and uh, some others, and uh, Rand. Uh, and um, nevertheless, the formula uh, pr proposed by Blechman is very simple. It's uh, just beautiful. And it works. Uh, we calculate it e easily. And uh, it uh, mm, uh, the results uh, is the same as uh, uh, experimental uh, results of experiments. No, so I think 
this formula was not did not appear in the previous work works i think so okay if you if you find this formula in uh, some other words please uh, send me the reference i think it is exactly the pechenev's formula hmm. uh, but obtained in a different way oh, it is interesting okay mm -hmm. i will check it also mm -hmm. thank you okay are there any other questions or comments It seems to be not the case. Uh, is Professor Indeitsov now here? If it is not the case, then we have uh, the next speaker is Dr. Vladislav Sorokin from the Oakland University, Ooh. but he could not attend uh, the meeting personally because of the large time difference between Russia and New Zealand. So he sent his uh, presentation to Professor Fratkov. And uh, I would ask Professor Fratkov if he could share this video. Um, by the way, what about his uh, co-author Ivan Demidov? Maybe he uh, wants to uh, uh, show this presentation. This, not presentation, this is a video. Is he yes. here? Unfortunately, I don't he uh, see his name here in the list. Mm. Okay. I'll try to find this presentation. Hmm. We see the presentation, uh, the video, but we do, don't hear the voice. You don't hear the voice? Yes. It's terrible. I cannot do anything. Так. Ivan Diminov is not here, yes? I don't know what to do. Do we have somebody from the service?
При запуске видео вам нужно нажать кнопку внизу «Совместное использование звука». Вот как? Где она внизу, эта кнопка? Нажмите кнопку «Демонстрация экрана». Так, сначала нажать «Демонстрация экрана». «Демонстрация экрана». Так. Выберите там свое видео и посмотрите внизу, вот на этом поле «Демонстрация экрана». Внизу слева... Есть галочка «Совместный доступ к звуку». А совместное использование? Вот это да, что? вам надо нажать эту галочку и запустить ваше видео. Так, теперь запускаю видео. Can you see, can you see video? Yes, but uh, I cannot hear him. No sound? No sound. Again. Maybe to go to the next one, I'll try to figure out what can be done. Okay. Давайте вы попробуйте переслать это видео на почту конференции, мы от себя его запустим, а вы пока можете сделать другой доклад. Отлично. Кому? Подольской можно переслать? Подольской, Ипатовой, кому угодно. Окей. Okay. Я сейчас напишу. You may continue, I think. I cannot continue. You have to close your... Uh, I sure. Uh, yes. yes. Sorry. No. <laughs> um, then I would ask Professor Katmel if he uh, were ready to continue. Yes, no problem. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Professor Katmel uh, will give a talk on the modeling, uh, the dynamics of a large-scale industrial manipulator for precision control. You are welcome. Thank you. Can you see this on the screen? Yes. Okay, I'm just shooting back through it. Excuse me. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Fradkoff, for inviting me to speak at this uh, important memorial occasion today. Uh, my name is Matthew Cartmel, and uh, my co-authors are Isabel Gordon, Daniel Johnston, Charlie Ang, Lynn McIntosh, and Bradley Wynn. And we are from uh, the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow in Scotland, UK, and also from the Advanced Forming Research Centre, which is uh, an independent but connected institute attached to the University of Strathclyde uh, in Glasgow. The title is Modelling the Dynamics of a Large-Scale Industrial Manipulator for Precision Control. Sorry. Okay, so I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and it's a great honor for me to be able to contribute to this um, presentation in memory of uh, Professor Ilya Israelovich Blechman. Uh, I had the great ple uh, pleasure and privilege of working with Professor Blechman at one time uh, on a funded Royal Society of London grant. And this paper below was a piece of work that we did in um, and the co-authors were Dr. Shishkina and Dr. Gavrilov. And in fact, in many ways, Dr. Shishkina led this project and we were able to work together as a, as a closely knit team, which was most enjoyable. And I learned a huge amount from Professor Blechman and, um, and, and the other colleagues as well, of course, on, on how to use the method of direct separation of motions, which was so interesting. Okay. So, um, to cut to the chase, Professor Blechman, in my opinion, was a great scientist, undoubtedly. He was also what we in English would say, uh, would call a consummate engineer. And he was um, a man of great practical thoughts as, and very creative. So I thought I would I'd dedicate this particular work to him. So um, in, this, in this picture here, you can see what is called the Future Forge Manipulator. And this has just been going through the process of installation at the Advanced Forming Research Center or the AFRC in Glasgow. And it's a piece of equipment which was designed in Germany by Schuler. 
Schuler AG, and it was built in Scotland by Klansman Dynamics, and it was installed at the AFRC. And so our um, involvement with this piece of work was after that. So once the machine was in the process of being installed, we came into the, the whole thing. I'll try and explain the story as we go along. So this machine is designed to carry metal ingots or big bars from storage to furnaces where they're heated up and then to feed them to a 2000 ton hydraulic press. And the idea there is that it undergoes, uh, these things undergo the forging operation. Um, the, the press is a, a very large scale system and it's part of the National Manufacturing Institute of Scotland. So it's, it's a very new venture here. And the university's role here is to look at the dynamics and then the control of this particular machine. And the reason we want to do that is to improve the controllability of the machine and also to, to create a, a digitalized version of all this so that we can train operators through virtual reality. So that's uh, the sort of aims of this project. Uh, as I said, it was designed by Schuler and uh, to specifications laid down by the AFRC and it was built and installed and commissioned by Klansman Dynamics of Glasgow. So we came into it after that point. So we had, we had no input whatsoever to the design of this machine. We had to take what we were given. And the brief was to, to create a, or derive, I should say really, a, a dynamic model for the motion of the machine. So what I'll give you today is a reduced version of that for what's called planar motion. In other words, the motion machine along the, the rails that you can see here. So the machine extending and retracting and operating in that direction. So here's a, a schematic view of this. And you can see here that this machine is driven by two cylinders. This one is, is known as the horizontal cylinder, although it's not purely horizontal. This one is the vertical cylinder here. And you can see there are three critical angles for the um, orientation and position of the machine, which define it completely. So alpha here, beta there, and gamma, okay? So um, we can see there that we, if, with those three angles, if we understand what they are and understand their behavior in time, then we understand where the end effector is here. And we, we use this point on uh, point W here to represent the end effector location with respect to some arbitrary uh, frame, which is fixed to the laboratory. So o, o, X, Y here is, is some point in the laboratory. Okay, so the way this was designed was that the um, phases of motion in vertical movement and horizontal movement would be separable and that the machine would operate in phases. So this is what we were given as, as the, um, the people coming to this project. And it's based, as you can see, on the idea of parallelogram linkages. So you can see this um, near vertical parallelogram here, this horizontal one or near horizontal one there, and the third one there. And the machine is, is a very neat design. Um, it preserves the um, integrity of the parallelogram link, uh, linkages very well. The way that's done in the top section here is through a complicated subsystem called the rear rocker. And we had to spend quite a lot of time on this. I'll, I'll um, summarize that as briefly as I can, but hopefully with a little bit of um, helpful insight as I go along. So, okay, so that's moving on from there. So um, vertical and horizontal operations are separate. And uh, so a vertical motion, for example, which is where the end effector is traveling vertically up and down here, requires one generalized coordinate effectively, which is the angle alpha. And that means that angle beta and gamma here must be fixed, they must be set. So you can imagine a situation where you have uh, a horizontal shift from uh, left to right or right to left, and then a vertical lift or lower, and some uh, various combinations of these types of motion so that we can get the end effector into pitable anywhere we would like within the uh, acceptable um, two-dimensional space with respect to the origin there. So for vertical motion here, we're dealing with one generalized coordinate, which is alpha. Now, of course, this requires us to know everything about the geometry of the machine in order to be able to make that sort of single, single degree of freedom model work. Um, so um, to cut to the chase here, if we're interested in the end effector position here, then we can obviously um, assign simple coordinates to that uh, with respect to the frame. So the vertical position is given by Y subscript EE. 
and the horizontal position is given by um, x uh, such that e e. And it's a very simple matter indeed to use the geometry of the machine to relate the um, position uh, uh, in y here to the horizontal datum there. So this little bit of simple uh, mathematics here gives us the, the position there. And you can see that it involves the, the angles alpha, which in this case is um, a function of time, beta and gamma, which are fixed because it's a vertical motion. And we've got these various linkage lengths here, which we have to be able to know accurately and um, various uh, positions where um, from, the, from the frame of reference. So conceptually, very simple indeed. Okay, the other thing of course we need to do is to be able to find the centroidal positions of all the important masses in the problem. And um, in order to do that, we have to know uh, the detailed geometry of each part, which was available from the animated CAD, which Schuler were able to provide us with. The other thing, as I mentioned before, was that there was a, a system inside here called the rear rocker, and that allows uh, several linkages to move in quite complicated ways to preserve the parallelogram shape of the upper system here, and that gives, that gives us a guaranteed integrity of motion. So that wasn't an entirely simple matter to deal with, and I'll skate over that in the presentation, but if you find this interesting, then um, uh, assuming that the paper is published, um, that we we're submitting, then um, you'll be able to read about that there. Okay, so let's just move on. Right, there we go. So, um, as I said, for vertical motion, the generalized coordinate is, is alpha of t, um, and so we're interested in working out where the end effector is. And of course, to know that we need to know the angles. So if we have our differential equation model in terms of the angle alpha, then obviously as we integrate that and solve that numerically, we can plug values for alpha into here, given fixed values for beta and gamma, which give the orientation from the previous horizontal um, operation, then we've got everything we need. We can calculate x and we can calculate y. We know where the end effector is. So um, we, we, we're going to use uh, simple Lagrangian dynamics to do this. So obviously one of the things that we need to understand is how to get generalized forces for the um, two different modes of operation. So in this particular case, we need the generalized force associated with alpha. This is actually a very simple thing to do. Um, I've, I've summarized it through here. Um, so we, we take a virtual displacement in angle alpha, and if we push through that, we eventually find the generalized force is simply the force, uh, vertical force in the hydraulic cylinder multiplied by the length of link AK. Very simple indeed. And so we can push that into, into the right-hand side here. And of course, if we then um, use the um, system energies, so we build them up, so we have potential energy here based on the gravitational potential energy, we are not including strain energy here because we're assuming that the, these uh, rigid links are truly rigid. And of course, when one looks at them and, and uh, sees them in practice, they are, they are enormously heavy, um, stiff um, structural elements. So I, I, for, for what we're trying to do here, that's perfectly okay. And of course, we have the kinetic energy as well. So we have kinetic energy in translation in X and Y for the various moving parts, and also some terms that they stick on the end here, which deal with rotation. And so um, in terms of vertical motion, we can use computer algebra to put together the differential equation uh, based on the Lagrangian dynamics of the problem. So um, the computer does this for us, so it's accurate. And we get this very long, complicated, messy looking equation here, which represents the vertical motion. It's a second order nonlinear ODE uh, for this machine undergoing vertical motion. And the, the, there are a lot of um, positional and configurational nonlinearities in here. Um, the, the frictional side of this is, is very simple. The joint friction is very low. And uh, we've covered that uh, by means of a classical linear viscous damping term here. Okay, so if we move to horizontal motion, then it's a little bit more complicated. We have uh, coordinates beta and um, gamma now and we, we maintain alpha at some fixed value. So if the machine is oriented so it's, it's in its upper configuration like this, then alpha reaches uh, plus 17.5 degrees. And if the machine is uh, at its lower configuration, in other words, it's pulled down vertically, then alpha goes to minus 17.5 degrees. And we can have settings in between if we wish. So those are the extremities of vertical motion and we can move horizontally um, as we like. So, um, so that's the scenario there. 
Um, and so once again, uh, we have to have a look at the, the equations for the end effector position. That's y and x here. And you can see that I've just reproduced them there. They're, they're these very simple expressions. But now, of course, they have beta and gamma as what appear to be generalized coordinates. And alpha there is a fixed value, whether uh, depends on whether the machine is up or down or somewhere in between, of course. Okay, now the rear rocker assembly is where the difficulties lie. Uh, in principle, it's not particularly difficult to deal with, but in practice, um, because of the way that the things interact, the algebra of this problem becomes quite, quite convoluted and complicated. And so um, without going into a lot of details, the rear rocker is shown partially here, it's hidden. Uh, these, these pictures, by the way, come from Schuler's animated CAD which we, we worked from quite closely. And you can see there's a linkage here, which is key to the whole thing, ST. In this orientation, it's vertical. That one there, ST is um, uh, sort of that angle there. And here we've got ST at that angle there. So we um, define ST's orientation by means of an another angle called phi. But very fortunately, phi and gamma can be shown to be related together in simple ways, which, can, which gives us a, a nice neat relationship which we can exploit. Also, the geometry of the rear rocker allows us to pick out the um, centroidal positions of key links, that's CZ and ZS in particular. Um, we can relate all these things to key positions of the machine itself. So again, conceptually, it's not too bad, but uh, in practice, the, the math starts to get a little bit long-winded. And you can see that for links CZ here, the Y and X centroidal positions, and for ZS and um, here, the, the Y and X centroidal positions, are beginning to blow up in terms of their uh, the terms. So nothing, nothing difficult, but just rather messy. Okay, so uh, going back to the rear rocker, we can show in fact that this um, important angle phi, which explains the orientation of this key link here, is related to gamma, it's simply gamma plus 30 degrees. And so we can then proceed to try to derive the uh, differential equations associated with horizontal motion. We do run into a problem. It's a computational problem, in fact, because the symbolic code reaches its recursion limit quite quickly because of the fact that we're, we're squaring and then adding and squaring more things, which are already quite complicated. So it becomes awfully um, big and, and complex. And uh, one way out of that is to do the job numerically and then go back to symbolic computing. And we played around with this a great deal. But again, the, there are more problems there. Um, and at the end of the day, it's actually simpler to, to um, rule out the rear rocker in terms of its dynamic contributions and see it purely as a kinematic linkage, which maintains the integrity of the machine. And in fact, that's borne out by a numerical calculation on mass here. So for example, the rear rocker parts constitute just over 1.1% of the overall mass of the moving parts of the machine, and um, just over 1.14% of the total mass moments of inertia of the moving parts of the machine. So from the dynamic perspective, particularly as it's a non-resonant problem, we're not running into difficulties by, by neglecting it here. Okay, so we can carry on with the generalized force for the, the beta coordinate there, and for the gamma coordinate it's zero. And so we end up with a situation where our differential equations are beginning to emerge in beta and gamma. Um, but then we have a little bit more good, good fortune in that we can show that gamma and beta are in fact related very, very simply. So gamma is in fact 90 degrees minus beta. And so gamma dot is minus beta dot. And that means that our number of differential equations then drops from two to one. And so we end up with one differential equation in beta. It's quite long, but it is at least just one equation. And in fact, there, we, there it is, it's reproduced from the symbolic code there. So although it's very long and complicated, there's nothing difficult about the principles of deriving it, as you can see, it's, it's straightforward, it's a systematic process. So we can then take those two differential equations and we can numerically integrate them in time for different sequences of motion. So for example, this one here, is where the manipulator is in, it starts at the lower left-hand side. So the machine can move from left to right, and then it reaches the end of that, and it does a vertical lift, okay? So here's a plot of the numerical integration for typical data for this machine. Please ignore that little bit there. That's, a, that's an artifact of uh, poor quality computing entirely down to myself. 
Uh, if I was a better computer programmer, I would have been able to have done this so that that wasn't there. So what happens is the machine starts across, runs from left to right here, and then starts to lift. And of course, because of the nature of the geometry of the machine, we get this. We tend to get this um, the horizontal shift with the vertical lift or the vertical drop. And apparently, according to the designers, that was that's a desirable thing. So they're, they're perfectly happy with that. So who am I to complain? So there we go. We have um, one particular case there. And you can see that the numbers are quite big. You know, these are in meters here. So this is a big machine executing big motions. Um, okay, I'll just, that's not very interesting. I'll just move on to there. So here's some further examples. So this one here is a machine which has already moved horizontally out as far as it'll go pretty well. And it's now going to lift. So it's going to, this, this is a simulation here using our, our um, differential equations. It's going to lift, and this little plot here shows you the lift profile there at the end effect. So you can see that it, it executes this uh, curved motion, uh, and, and that's a very obvious thing given the nature of the geometry of the problem. Uh, the next one here is where, um, sorry, uh, where we've got a, the manipulators at a high position on the far right-hand side. We're going to drop it down. Okay, so you can see that we're going to start here and go down. So this is tracking down like that. Uh, here's the next one. This is very at the far left here. We're going to do a horizontal shift from left to right. So there we go, nice horizontal shift from left to right. And finally, we're going to do a horizontal shift or a sweep from right to left. So there we go. So uh, and there are so many different combinations of this uh, type of motion uh, that we could execute with this particular model. Okay, now we move on to the work. This is work that I, I did mostly myself. Now we're moving on to the work that's done by a PhD student, Daniel Johnston. And I'm going to quickly paraphrase Daniel's work. Um, he's very much deeply involved in this. So we decided that we'd give you a quick summary of what he's doing here. Uh, he's trying to reduce those two lengthy differential equations to a compact form, which we can use in the nonlinear control procedure. So to cut to the chase again, those two um, horrendous looking equations I showed you can be reduced down to some things that, things that look like this here. Okay, and so what we're doing here, we're, we're going to evaluate the significance of the various terms which are the coefficients in the two differential equations. And when we do that, we come up with a table of typical numbers like this. And if we just take the first four, that's coefficients A1, A2, A3, A4, that's A1, A2, A3, A4 in here, just so that we can do this quickly, we can see that there are, uh, they can be compared. And from that comparison, we can introduce a small parameter, which allows us to scale um, the smaller terms. And in fact, uh, there are arguments to scale them to epsilon or to epsilon squared. For the time being, we're sticking with epsilon. We think that's a more appropriate, um, given, given the range of numbers possible, we think that's a more appropriate scaling. And so we get down to the order one problem here, and it, it boils down to something that looks like that. Um, and of course, if we if we plot potential energy here against the actuation angle, then the potential is in fact pretty linear across the operational range. Um, so just repeating the last equation there, we can generalize it. And in fact, for either vertical or horizontal, we, we begin to get equations that look like this at order one there. Um, and of course, for the sort of data we're interested in, this machine behaves quite well. There are no, um, really no dynamic complexities at all, but, the future will show a very different scenario because we'll be imposing um, vibration on top of the rigid body motion of this machine. And there, there are manufacturing reasons for having to do that. And once we do that, then things become more complex, but that is for the future, it's for Daniel and his PhD um, to, to, to develop. So final conclusions are, um, this large scale machine was installed at the Advanced Forming Research Center um, near Glasgow for uh, use in the, in the Scottish um, National Manufacturing Institute's Future Forge research program. Um, the manipulator was designed and built by external companies. We had, uh, we in the university had no connection whatsoever. They designed and built this thing to specifications which were given by, to them by the AFRC. Um, it, it works independently in vertical lift and horizontal travel. We built our differential equation model um, the, the, the process of getting that was pretty straightforward. It was conceptually simple, obviously. Uh, there was a lot of detail involved, uh, which we had to get right. So we used a lot of symbolic computing to do that, to make sure that we didn't make mistakes. And I've shown you some of the numerical integration results there. And I've shown you where we're going with the, um, with the, with the reduced form of that. 
Uh, the next phase is to, is, is to design and build a nonlinear control system to do this. At the moment, it's um, using um, uh, a, very, a very simple uh, PID type of approach using um, commercial uh, black box control system units. Um, that will certainly not be good enough for the future, which is why we're involved in this work. So um, thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kotnel. Uh, the talk is open for discussion. Uh, are there any questions or comments? I don't see uh, the right hands or uh, comments. I have one question concerning the actuation of your machine. Mm -hmm. As far as I understood, uh, there are some hydraulic cylinders for the actuation, but you don't take their internal dynamics uh, into account. Why? Yeah, thank you. At this stage, we're uh, at modeling, we're considering the forces that can be uh, provided by those actuating cylinders and not the details of how they work. That's an extremely interesting point because Obviously, in the vertical lift scenarios, the vertical cylinder will have to counter our gravity. So it's having to hold up a great deal of mass before it can lift. And if it lets it drop, then it has also has to make sure that that's done in a controlled manner. So the, the details, the mechanical details of that system are, um, have been specified by the designers. And we, we actually don't have access to them. So uh, we're able to say what those forces should be to get those profiles that we showed you. But we can't see any more than that. One thing I do know is that they have a quite a, an ingenious system of hydraulic locking so that the machine can be, once it's got to the right position, it can be locked. And, it can, and that's done apparently quite, quite smoothly. So the, there's a, the, the minimization of perturbation of the, of the end effector. So the end effector uh, goes to where it should be and it stays there uh, with very little micro vibration at the end of that. Uh, but I only have that on hearsay. I, I have not seen that or had any more detail. So from our input, we, we are simply considering the hydraulic um, cylinders as components providing uh, forces, which we would then you know, use in our model. I see. I have uh, a little bit experience in a completely different area mm -hmm. in uh, automotive applications where also hydraulic control systems are used very uh, usually. And uh, from that side, I cannot, transfer this experience to your machine. But from that side, uh, they can influence the whole dynamics very strongly. Right. And uh, it is not realistic to um, try to develop a control uh, strategy without, without taking mm. the hydraulic part of the plant into account. Sure. Because it won't do what you want to. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. I think when the time comes, um, Klansman Dynamics will release the, all the information about the hydraulic system and we will, um, we will have freedom to, to critique that and possibly even to suggest changes to it. But yes, thank you for that. Very, very helpful point. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, can I uh, one question? Yes, very short. Question. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Uh, you. Can you estimate the maximum possible vibration of the end effector in this system as compared with, uh, I think, few meters of the size? Of yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. We're, we're, we've actually been contracted to do this in two stages. So at the moment, we've been told specifically to concentrate on rigid body motions and mm -hmm. you know, to, to forget about the micro vibration possibilities at the end. But I'm 100% certain that this is a key thing to, to deal with. And so once the Future Forge system is operating in practice, mm -hmm. it will have to be able to work to you know, very, very precise levels at the, at the end effector. And we're waiting for numbers. As soon as the numbers are released to us, then that will be the, the trigger for us to, you know, to expand our thinking on that one. But at the moment, we've been, we've been told uh, to leave that alone. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you very, thank much. very much. Any other questions or comments? 
if it is not the case, uh, I would like to thank Professor Katmel once more for his nice talk. And thank you. the next question is to the host. Are you able to uh, show the video by Dr. Sarokin? Video так не прислали. Video не прислали. Okay, then we skip it. And I would like to ask if Mr. Vedinev is here. He's in the audience, as far as I can see. Is it true? Your uh, microphone is not uh, switched on. Yeah, now you can hear us. Yes, OK. Uh, then I would like to introduce the next speaker. It is uh, Professor Doctor, I don't know, uh, Mr. Vedinev. And the title of uh, his talk is New mechanism uh, of the onset of error elastic divergence. Just a second, please. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My talk will include not just mechanical oscillation, but some uh, interaction with airflow. And uh, I will start with uh, two possible instabilities of uh, mechanical system interacting with airflow. One of them is a divergence, which is a static instability, which means that, for example, a wing just uh, lose the stability through zero frequency um, statically. And uh, the second instability is flutter, which is oscillatory, and uh, the wing or other system oscillates before uh, transition to the instability. Uh, and uh, uh, if we open any book on air elasticity, we will see that uh, these two types of instability are usually considered separately. For example, there is a chapter devoted to static instability where divergence is considered, and another chapter on uh, dynamic instability where flutter is considered. And the question is uh, whether, what if we use uh, unsteady aerodynamics for the analysis of divergence? And uh, this is what I want to consider in this study. Uh, I will. Um, analyze very simple system, which is uh, usually considered in any uh, aerolastic textbook. Uh, as an example, here, uh, I will consider a two degree of freedom wing, uh, which, ca which has a bending degree of freedom and torsional degree of freedom. And uh, on the bottom <coughs> of the slide, there is an equation, uh, there are equations of motions where Q, B, and Q So these are uh, QB and QT uh, T uh, generalized coordinates uh, corresponding to bending and torsional degrees of freedom. And uh, there is a mass matrix, uh, stiffness matrix, and on the uh, right hand side there is a generalized forces which comes from airflow, bending and torsion. Uh, and the question, uh, principal question is how we calculate these gener aerodynamic generalized forces. Uh, usually for analysis of divergence, uh, quasi-static aerodynamics is used. However, we will consider fully unsteady aerodynamics, uh, assuming that uh, in each uh, two-dimensional cross-section there is a quasi-two-dimensional airflow. 
and then we have a problem of uh, just a plate which oscillates in two-dimensional airflow and this problem, uh, solution to this problem is well known uh, which is given by these formulas um, and the uh, important point here is that aerodynamic lift and aerodynamic moment are uh, expressed through so-called Theodorson function uh, C uh, which in its turn uh, is a function of reduced frequency and this reduced frequency is in general case can be complex so this is just a complex, uh, quite complex expression and we will um, use it for calculating uh, stability boundaries after uh, substituting all these expressions into the equations of motions we uh, simply get the frequency equation uh, which is uh, common for the mechanical system uh, but um, from aerodynamics here we have a, a DA matrix which is a aerodynamic damping and KA matrix which is a aerodynamic stiffness and uh, uh, looking briefly we can see that this is a polynomial equation of the fourth order uh, as usual in two dimensional systems but actually it's not because uh, uh, the frequency uh, omega and k uh, reduced frequency k uh, it's, it's uh, included into aerodynamic matrices through a very complex way so this is actually a transcendental equation and we don't have any theorems, theorems uh, telling how many roots this equation can have and uh, other we don't know in general case uh, other properties of this equation uh, we will uh, this fact actually will hold the problems which I will show now uh, we will solve uh, initially this equation uh, just numerically by iterative solution and here uh, some parameters which I will use for calculating, uh, this is the link uh, which has a 8 hertz uh, torsional natural frequency and 70 hertz um, 70 hertz of bending torsional frequency. Uh, okay, so let's start from uh, steady aerodynamics and assume that uh, in aerodynamic forces assume that there is zero oscillation frequency then all this aerodynamic theory just is reduced to the quasi-static aerodynamics where the lift force is proportional to the angle of attack and uh, um, uh, let's consider the uh, complex plane of uh, complex frequency we have four uh, roots of the frequency equation uh, two of them are on the right hand side and two on the left hand side and uh, they are symmetrical so we will consider just two uh, which are on the right hand side omega one, omega one is a torsional um, eigenfrequency and the omega 2 is the bending kind of frequency and you can see that when increasing the flow speed uh, the torsional frequency uh, decreases up to zero and then it coalesces with uh, omega 1 and omega 3 they coalesce and the transition to instability takes place uh, this is a natural mechanism of divergence which, which can be found in any example of uh, a realistic system Let's now include some aerodynamic damping uh, in a simplified form. Uh, namely, we will uh, include this, uh, this aerodynamic deriv derivative. Uh, and what we will see is just very similar behavior of eigenfrequencies, but all the frequencies become slightly damped. So they, they are shifted to the upper half plane, which is a, a damped plane, it's a stability plane. And still we have uh, coalescence <coughs> of uh, the torsional modes uh, on the imaginary uh, part and after which uh, the transition to divergence takes place. However, here we can note that uh, assumption that uh, this aerodynamic derivative is real, minus 1.2, is not well because the frequencies are now com complex and uh, 
also the, all the remaining forces uh, must be complex. And this can be, uh, this theory can be improved by including some imaginary part of the aerodynamic forces. And uh, after that, we will see that uh, the direct uh, coalescence of higher frequencies disappeared, and uh, we uh, see this hyperbolic type of interaction, one of the torsional modes uh, going up to the stability and uh, another going down to the divergence. Uh, but uh, actually this picture of th this uh, eigenfrequency lock is not physically meaningful because uh, the motion of eigenfrequencies must be symmetrical with respect to the imaginary axis always. Uh, because actually uh, if, if we consider uh, any frequency with eigen eigenvector and uh, a frequency which is um, which is uh, reflected with respect to the imaginary axis, just with different sign of the real part. Uh, then uh, we will have exactly the same motion of the wing, which means that they, these two frequencies represent the same um, uh, physical motion. And uh, this type of behavior, uh, it, it's common for flutter, but it's not uh, it's, it, it cannot be valid for uh, transition to divergence. And uh, we can try to improve this solution uh, simply by considering uh, different values of um, imaginary part of aerodynamic derivatives, uh, like this one, just uh, to get the symmetrical picture. However, here we, we have some problem with the mode which, go, which is going to divergence. It looks strange, and we can improve it as well uh, to get uh, this type of uh, eigenfrequency motion. But um, finally, uh, we should uh, mention several very strange things. Uh, first of all, we, we can <coughs> see that uh, structural modes, which usually uh, inter interaction of structural modes is um, uh, yields the transition to divergence. Here all the structural modes become damped. They go up, not down. Uh, however, still we have a divergence mode, which is uh, its not clear where it comes from. It's, it's, it is uh, separated from uh, the motion of structural eigenfrequencies. Uh, also, we can mention that the number of solutions of roots of the frequency equation is different. There are four equations at the subcritical divergence speed and uh, five uh, roots at the uh, uh, velocities higher than the uh, critical divergence. And uh, the, the actual reason of these strange points is that we use, um, we don't use exact unsteady aerodynamics in these calculations. We use some surrogates, either quasi -static, static aerodynamics or some improvements, which are all physically not uh, fully correct. And uh, to resolve this problem, we now switch to fully unsteady aerodynamics. We just uh, use uh, it as is. And uh, the calculations again shows that uh, there are, uh, we can see here two bending frequencies, omega 2 and omega 4, which are just slightly damped and do not interact. And uh, torsional frequencies, omega 1 and omega 3, uh, which are uh, torsional, they uh, stay damped when we increasing the flow speed. Uh, so no instability coming from structural modes. However, if we we know that uh, divergence exists and if we take um, uh, critical divergence speed and zero frequency as initial approximation and start uh, increasing the flow speed, then we will see that uh, the divergence mode exists and uh, it, it is uh, it's going down along the uh, imaginary part of the complex plane. However, if we try to decrease the velocity back to, to get the subcritical speed, then the numerical solution just diverges. And uh, numerically, it, it's impossible to get the solution uh, for the root 
for the divergence root before the divergence, which means again that there are four roots at the lower speeds, but five five roots at uh, larger speeds, which is uh, not very well understood, and uh, it has to be resolved somehow. Uh, another pro uh, um, uh, what can be thought is that this is just a numerical problem and uh, which is not exist in reality uh, however it's possible to prove in uh, analytically that the divergence speed does not exist at subcritical speeds we can we, we took uh, zero frequency and uh, diversion speed and then take a small deviation of the flow speed from the divergence and uh, look the solution to the uh, eigenfrequency equation which is close to zero uh, to do this we uh, transform we expand the television function uh, near zero frequency we can mention that it has a logarithmic singularity here uh, and finally due to this logarithmic singularity the solution exists only at uh, v prime uh, larger than zero, uh, but the solution does not exist at uh, negative v prime, which means that indeed the divergence uh, eigenfrequency exists only at subcritical uh, on, uh, for supercritical speeds. And the reason of this is the logarithmic singularity uh, of the Theodorsen function. Uh, well, still, uh, it is uh, now explained mathematically why this uh, strange thing happens, but uh, it's still not clear why it happens physically. Uh, to explain this, cons uh, consider the initial value problem for the, uh, for the wing. We have uh, zero, uh, sorry, non-zero uh, initial conditions, and we take Laplace transformation of the equations of motion, and then we get uh, in Laplace uh, transformed equations in, in form uh, shown here. Uh, and um, uh, it's important that the matrix of this Laplace transformed transformation is exactly the same as the matrix of the frequency equation. And uh, the initial conditions uh, are sitting on the right hand side. Uh, then we uh, solve this uh, algebraic. Uh, algebraic linear system equations by Kramer rule and uh, then take back the uh, original solution to the eigenvalue to the initial value problem through a to inverse uh, Laplace transformation which is given by uh, this uh, no, uh, formula and the important point here is that uh, the kernel function they have a frequency equation at uh, the denominator. Now, integration here takes place along a horizontal line in the complex plane, and then we start to move this integration path up to get the final solution of the initial value problem. Uh, there are two types of singularities which should be passed. One, uh, the, fir the first type of singularities is the uh, poles of the integral uh, in, in, uh, of the function under the integral which is uh, um, both are passed in a standard form which uh, when we pass the pole we have a separation of the uh, eigenmode from the uh, solution and finally uh, we have a branch cut which cannot be uh, passed and uh, we still have um, in the final solution of the initial value problem shown at the bottom of the slide, we have two terms. The second term is a sum over uh, eigen, eigen modes. Um, and also we have a second part, which is a representation of a continuous spectrum of this system. And uh, this continuous system is something that was not existed if we uh, solve the problem uh, solve the eigenvalue problem directly. Actually, this um, uh, continuous spectrum exists and it occupies the uh, uh, positive imaginary half axis and physically it represents the 
reflection of wake behind the wing. When the wing oscillates, there is a wake which uh, remembers all the preceding motion of the wing. Uh, and now it's clear that uh, in the behavior of eigenfrequencies, there, there is a continuous spectrum on the positive imaginary axis, uh, and uh, the divergence eigenfrequency is separated from this continuous spectrum when we uh, cross the critical divergence. Uh, this is what happens when we use fully unsteady aerodynamics. However, however, if we took uh, uh, simpler theory like quasi-steady aerodynamics, uh, the kernel function and aerodynamic function, they don't have any branch cuts, they don't have any singularities, they are just constants, and uh, in this case we have transition to divergence through the uh, coalescence of uh, two torsional uh, frequencies. However, this doesn't take place if we have fully unsteady aerodynamics. Um, okay, let's now move to comparison with um, several studies. Uh, there are actually very few papers that consider divergence in the framework of uh, fully unsteady aerodynamics. Uh, and uh, one series of papers is um, uh, up to, uh, the eigenvalue eigen problem is solved through so-called PK method. And uh, what is observed in these solutions is that besides the structural modes, there are also some other routes exist, uh, which are called uh, so-called aerodynamic leg modes. Uh, and uh, the contradictory results obtained in these studies is that the transition to divergence was um, a, um, divergence was a result of aerodynamic leg mode, but not as a result of a structural oscillations, which is uh, actually um, agrees with uh, the results just presented. Also, there is just one uh, paper uh, where uh, fully exact aerodynamic, uh, fu fully unsteady Theodorson aerodynamics was used, and uh, what they obtained is uh, exactly what uh, I just described: that the divergence mode it it did not exist when we have a subcritical flow speed, but did but did exist when we uh, increase the flow speed, and it, it is not a result of uh, interaction of structural modes. And finally, uh, I would like to consider uh, NASA report uh, where both computationally and uh, experimentally uh, transition to divergence was studied uh, in the framework of unsteady aerodynamics. What was obtained in uh, calculations is that um, indeed the divergence was resulted from aerodynamic route, but not from structural route. And we can see here. Uh, the motion of um, on the upper figure there is a reduced velocity along horizontal axis and uh, frequency of oscillations along the vertical axis and we can see here that the during the transition to instability there is no decrease of the torsional degree of freedom uh, of torsional frequency uh, and the instability comes from the aerodynamic route and uh, finally, the experiment showed that, uh, again, on the upper figure we can see the angle of attack of experimental wing as a function of velocity, and we can see the critical uh, flow speed or time uh, at which the velocity in, uh, passed the uh, critical diversion speed when the angle of attack suddenly increased up to 10 degrees. And on the uh, bottom picture, we can see uh, continuous tracking of uh, torsional frequencies of the wing. And we can see that uh, frequencies are decreasing, but they are not decreasing down to zero, which means that the transition to instability could, uh, cannot be a result of interaction of uh, two structural modes, uh, but results from uh, different type of modes, uh, which uh, comes from aerodynamic. Finally, uh, coming to conclusion, uh, the result is that when we use fully unsteady aerodynamics transition to divergence 
uh, does not occur from the interaction of structural modes, but occurs from uh, appearance of a new uh, of a new eigenfrequency which did not exist at uh, subcritical speeds. Uh, this additional mode separates from the continuous spectrum at zero frequency when we're crossing the divergence speed. And when we're using quasi-steady aerodynamics instead of full unsteady aerodynamics, this type of interaction that does not exist and uh, transition to divergence occurs through the interaction of structural modes, which means that it's completely different uh, physical mechanism of instability. Uh, uh, the use of numerical methods yields the breakup of the continuous spectrum, uh, which uh, is obtained here analytically, into a discrete, uh, discrete either uh, infinite discrete spectrum of aerodynamic modes, or if we use low uh, degree of freedom approximation of aerodynamic modes, then we have just a couple uh, or three uh, additional aerodynamic modes, and the even in this case, the transition to divergence comes from the, this additional aerodynamic modes, but not from structural eigenfrequencies. Uh, and finally, I would know, like to know that I consider it just a very simple uh, two degree of freedom system, but uh, this, can, this result can be easily generalized to any three-dimensional aeroelastic system because it has uh, uh, the same, it, its aerodynamic kernel functions have the same branch cuts as uh, the adversion function. And uh, finally, this is a paper when uh, more uh, results can be found, and uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vedinev. Are there any questions? I don't see any requests for questions, and unfortunately, we are running out of time. That's why I would uh, go further to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Pogromsky. Uh, I have seen him. Yes, he is here. Uh, the title of his talk is unidirectional synchronization under communication constraints. Thank you. Please. You are, uh, uh, you have switched off your microphone. Okay, now. now, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So now I will try to share my screen. Okay, so first, please confirm if you if you see me and if you yes. see me. Okay, good. Okay, so my name is Alexander Pogoromsky from Mindhorn University of Technology. And first of all, thank you very much. And special thanks to the organizers of this event for a great opportunity and also an honor uh, to present here some results, some recent results, which we derived in collaboration with Christoph Cowan from Munich and Professor Alexey Matvey from St. Petersburg State University. And as all of you know, Professor Blechman was keen on synchronization. And in my presentation, I will dare to look at our present results from his eyes, if it's possible to say so. Okay. So uh, here's the outline of my talk, and I will start with introduction. Then uh, I pose the problem of unidirectional synchronization as the remote state estimation problem. Then I will present the main result, and this res result will be supported by a number of examples. And I will finish my talk with some concluding remarks. So now uh, we more and more shifted towards networks. And if you hear the words networks, 
communication, then we can uh, foresee at least two different scenarios, either communicating agents. So for example, sensors and controllers have to communicate via communication network. So for example, via internet, or another scenario is when different dynamical systems coupled together via communication channels eventually should exhibit some kind of coherent behavior or they have to demonstrate synchronization. So these kind of problems uh, nowadays become more and more popular. And in my talk, I'm going to forget about the whole network and to focus only on two agents communicating to each other. And the work unidirectional in my uh, talk, in my title, indicates that one agent sends information to the second agent and the second agent has to be familiar of what's going on at the remote location despite the communication constraints, digital constraints in the communication channel. Yeah. Okay, uh, so briefly, uh, the framework which I'm going to deal with here today is depicted on this figure. So we have a sensor which has a full access to the system state. And somehow this knowledge should be encoded into a message and finally sent by a communication channel to the second remote peer. And the goal of this remote peer is to be able to reconstruct the system state X, which is called X hat here with a reasonable accuracy. Yeah. And the main constraint in this, in this problem is that the message which is sent by the communication channel belongs to a finite alphabet. So the communication rate is limited, yeah? Okay, now I'm going to pose my problem in a more or less uh, formal setting. So suppose we are given a dynamics, which could be either discrete time or continuous time. So now uh, for the sake of, how to say, definiteness, let's deal with the discrete time system. So this dynamics evolves on a compact set capital K, and we assume that this set is forward invariant. Yeah. So the initial accuracy of our remote state estimation problem is assumed to be known no worse than a delta. Yeah. So the remote peer is aware of the true position of X with the accuracy no worse than delta, and delta is our parameter. And there are two important ingredients in our communication scheme, the quarter and the quarter. The quarter, based on the history of the measurements, generates a message E from a finite, uh, from a finite alphabet. And this message E has to be squeezed in the communication channel with capacity C. And the capacity C is defined as the number of bits the channel is able to transmit up to this moment of time divided by the moment of time. And the assumption that this limit is well defined. So there is another ingredient in our communication scheme called decoder. And the decoder has to be able to perform some kind of inverse operation. So based on the all messages received so far, the decoder generates an estimate x hat, and this estimate x hat should be sufficiently close to the true value of x. Yeah? And now we have to clarify how the communication uh, algorithm communication scheme depends on um, the way we define how this quantity should be small, in what sense. Okay, so we will distinguish three different types of observability via communication channel with constrained capacity. Okay, first, if for any epsilon we can find a delta, 
so that if initial mismatch is no worse than delta, then in future, the difference is no worse than epsilon. In this situation, we say that our communication scheme, our system is observable by communication channel with final capacity C. So if we impose a little bit stronger requirement, namely if initial mismatch no worse than delta in future will result in exponential decay of the estimation error to zero and exponentially. And if this property holds uniformly for all deltas smaller than some threshold, then we say that our system is finally, is fine observable by a communication channel with capacity C. And if this forgetting factor is zero, then we say that our system is regularly observable. Yeah. So I gave you three different definitions. And then you can pose a question. What is the minimal channel capacity required to guarantee regular foreign or observability? And the answer to this question is given by so-called data rate theorems. I'm not going to go into details, but I simply formulate the statement as the fine observability rate or regular observability rate. So the minimal possible communication rate to ensure fine or regular observability is given by what is called restoration entropy. Okay, it's a complete answer, but unuseful, unuseful in uh, practice because what we have to know in the practice, given dynamics, how to find this restoration entropy. And if you're able to find that restoration entropy, the second question is how to design a communication protocol which achieves synchronization or observability. And I'm going to share with you our recent results on those answers. Okay, for the sake of completeness now, I'm going to present the main result for continuous time. So suppose we are given a dynamics and this dynamics is defined as a compact set K, which is formed in my so the capital A stands for the Jacobian of the right-hand side. So now with A defined here for some capital P, which is assumed to be a positive definite state dependent matrix, I look at the solution of this algebraic equation, yeah? And the solutions of, the, uh, of this algebraic equation are denoted by sigma. And now I claim that with such sigmas at hands, I can find an upper estimate of the restoration entropy by this formula. So what I have to do is to find the maximum between those sigmas and zero to maximize them over all possible x in the set K and it will give me the smallest uh, upper estimate of the restoration entropy, which is by definition is the smallest possible communication rate to guarantee fine observability. Okay, it gives me an upper bound of the restoration entropy. And it turns out that the same scheme can be used also to find the lower estimate. And this lower estimate is quite close in spirit to the second Lipanov method. And in what sense? If I select an appropriate uh, arbitrary number epsilon, it's always possible to find a positive definite matrix P so that if I use this P in this formula, then this estimate or this estimate is epsilon close to the true value of the restoration entropy. So I can sandwich the true value of the restoration entropy with two quantities which are arbitrarily close to each other. Yeah. Or another way, the restoration entropy is given as a solution of the minimization problem where I minimize this formula over all possible smooth 
uh, positive definite matrices P's. So P can be treated as a Riemannian metric. So I presented you a way how to find the smallest possible rate to achieve synchronization between master and sway. For now, the question is how to design the communication protocol between the communication peers. Yeah? And I'm going to illustrate that in a graphical way. So suppose we have two communication peers, Alice and Bob. Both of them are aware of the dynamics, phi. So for simplicity in discrete time now. So Bob knows initial condition with some uncertainty, Bob here. Alice knows the initial condition exactly because she can measure the trajectory of this system. And she knows what is known to Bob, the uncertainty, initial uncertainty ball, uh, black ball, red ball. So our next step in the communication protocol is to estimate or to over approximate the image of this ball under these dynamics. And Alice also knows that the image of this point is somewhere inside of this ellipsoid. Yeah. So the Bob, uh, Bob can uh, repeat the calculations performed by Alice and to end up with the same set. Our next step is to cover the ellipsoid by balls of the radius no larger than the initial ball. Yeah. And Alice uh, can do this operation as a part of communication protocol. And this procedure can be repeated by Bob to end up with the same covering. Then Alice notes the ball depicted here by blue, which contains the image of the initial point. And what she has to do next is to index all the balls from one to capital N. And this indexing procedure can be repeated also by Bob. Yeah. Then what we have to do is simply to transmit the index of the blue ball from Alice to Bob. And in order to do that, we have to send only logarithm of N bits of information. Yeah. Once this data is received by Bob, then he knows for sure that the index or the image of the point x0 is somewhere here in blue ball. And then history repeats itself and Alice and Bob can keep on uh, communicating in such a way and the communication uh, estimation error will never exceed the radius of the original ball. And the scheme which I showed you and illustrated was implemented in a number of examples. And for those number of examples, we found exhaustive answer on the uh, quantity which is called restoration entropy. And we did it for a particular case of Riemannian metric uh, presented here. So uh, the matrix uh, P is a product of a positive definite matrix times some scale of function. And also it's quite uh, important for us that some of those ideas were implemented also in the lab environment and we were able to uh, perform some experiments with the remote state observation of the unicycle robot. And before I complete my presentation, I welcome all of you to the session devoted to uh, Professor Blechman after six o'clock because I'm going to share some pictures with you and also to support uh, with pictures the material presented in the first lecture by uh, Professor Fratkov. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Pogromsky. Are there any questions or comments?
May may I ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, you tried to, to relate your uh, results to the view on synchronization by Professor Blackman. Uh, in what respect? How could could you clarify this issue? Uh, okay, so uh, he was keen on synchronization, and uh, uh, to be honest, in our research, we never try to uh, how to say to present or to interpret our results as a synchronization. Uh -huh. Before uh, recently, we started to uh, look at consensus problems in networks. So at least uh, if I uh, have more time, uh, maybe I will uh, <laughs> say, uh, explain that after six o'clock, uh, the look of uh, Professor Blechman of interconnected systems on interconnected systems were a little bit uh, different as uh, what we got used in our control community. So when we talk about networks of systems, for him, the most important part were systems and not uh, the way uh, they were interconnected because according to him, uh, interconnections had to be small, yeah? So he used to say tendency of synchronization. So by means of small interconnections, the uh, systems should finally exhibit synchronization, yeah? That was more or less his way of uh, looking at synchronization program. And uh, in our research, uh, the concept of small control or small, uh, how to say, um, interconnections is replaced by something similar in spirit because we look at the uh, smallest possible communication rate. Of course, it's not the same as uh, he looked at, but at least close in spirit. Yeah, is it an answer to your question? Yes, I understand. At least I better understand now. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? If it is not the case, we will continue this discussion in the second part of the today meeting. And uh, let us go further to our next speaker. It is Professor uh, Panovka from Moscow. Professor Panovka, are you here? I have seen him. Yes, yes. Thank you, yes. Uh, the title of his talk uh, is Self-Synchronization of Inertial Vibration Excitors in a System with an Elastic Limiter. OK, thank you very much. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I apologize uh, to Professor Matthew Kerman, Kerman, Kerman uh, but first I will say a few words in Russia. I don't have any secrets. Uh, it's just that my English is not very good. And then the report will be made by my co-author, Dr. Alexander Shokhin. Thank you. Ну, во-первых, я хочу всех поблагодарить за возможность участия э, в конференции и в первую очередь поблагодарить Дмитрия Анатольевича за организацию сегодняшней сессии, посвященной Леониду Ильи э, Блехману. Э, я думаю, что это достойное выражение нашей памяти и нашей благодарности Ильи Израильчу за тот вклад и в науку, и в каждого из нас за открытие новых направлений и новых наших э, исследований. Мне очень приятно видеть наших моих друзей здесь, и Александра Яковлевича, и Александра Львовича, э, с которыми сложились очень теплые дружественные отношения. Ну а дальше я передаю слово своему соавтору, 
Шохину Александру. Спасибо. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexander Shokin. I work in Mechanical Engineering Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Is my presentation uh, is clearly uh, can be seen. Excuse me. Yes, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. Well, uh, the phenomenon of uh, uh, dynamic object self-synchronization uh, is uh, well known for a long period of time, uh, and uh, it was apparently first mentioned in the works of Gugens, who observed the synchronization of pendulum clocks uh, on a wall. Over the past century, thanks to the efforts of Russian and foreign scientists, the theory of uh, dynamical system uh, uh, self-synchronization has been significantly developed and the effects, effect uh, has found uh, many technical applications. Uh, among these works, of course, it's uh, worth noting the works of Ilya Israelish Blechman, in particular his book, uh, Synchronization of Dynamical Systems, which sets out uh, the uh, mathematical apparatus of this theory as well as considers various practically important uh, problems. Note that this book pays special attention to the phenomenon of self-synchronization of uh, inertial vibration exciters, which has found practical application in modern vibration techniques. So uh, this work is uh, devoted uh, to the problem of ensuring the stability of near resonance vibration modes of technological vibration vibrating machines excited by self-synchronizing material, uh, self-synchronizing vibration exciters. Uh, most uh, vibro machines uh, with self-synchronizing natural vibration exciters operate uh, in the far from resonance frequency range. This is due to the high sensitivity of the resonant uh, oscillation amplitudes and uh, the mutual phase of synchronous rotation of vibration exciters to change of the technological load on the machine working element. There are many works that was devoted to the development and calculations uh, of these machines, including uh, the works of uh, works um, by Blechman, Weisberg, Radkov, uh, and uh, many, others, many other researchers. In resonance machines, either one vibration exciters is usually used to excite oscillations, uh, or several exciters operating in uh, force synchronization mode <clears throat> to create the required configuration of exciting force. Uh, it is uh, known that the use of self-synchronizing vibration exciters can significantly simplify uh, the design of vibro machine, which is undoubtedly of practical interest. So, in this work, we consider uh, the dynamics of vibrating uh, machine the model, with, which uh, has two vib uh, vibration, ex uh, vibration exciters. <coughs> And the uh, ex excitation of, uh, of the smashing oscillation is uh, considered in near resonance frequency range. A uh, feature of this system uh, is in the presence of the elastic limiter, which uh, is mounted with uh, certain initial clearance uh, to the working element. So, uh, the exciters are rotated uh, by the, these exciters are uh, rotating in opposite directions and are driven by uh, uh, two electric motors, uh, non ideal motors, uh, asynchronous type, uh, which uh, uh, torque characteristics are. They can into account by the close formula shown here on this slide. 
And here, uh, this slide. <coughs> Those are the uh, equations of motion of the system. Uh, in these equations, uh, the interaction of the mesh and working element with uh, the process material is taken into account by the added mass. Oh, sorry. By the added mass, which is included into the inertial parameters of the system, and by the forces and uh, the moment of, vis of viscous uh, friction, equivalent viscous friction, uh, which is proportional to the material mass on uh, to material mass. So uh, uh, this uh, force is. Uh, <clears throat> so this term uh, takes into account uh, the force of the you know, produced by the limiter when it's in contact with the working element. So this slide shows the frequency characteristics of the system in the case of vibrations uh, without uh, contact with the limiter. Such characteristics are usually used. Uh, in designing the vibra uh, vibrating machines, uh, and here they are presented for further uh, comparison purposes. In the picture on the left, uh, the peak to peak amplitudes are shown uh, depending on the frequency, depending on the frequency, and uh, for different uh, values of the material mass and in the, in the picture on the right uh, the phase shifts the phase shifts uh, depending on the uh, excitation frequency and for the different values of the material mass so this characteristic clearly demonstrates uh, clearly demonstrate the complexity of working in the resonance uh, resonance frequency resonant frequency range. In the resonant mode, due to the high, sensit high sensitivity to material mass change, as a required operating mode of the vibrating machine, we will consider uh, <coughs> the frequency range near the second resonance in which purely vertical oscillations are excited in an unloaded machine. So one can see that a change in the mass, the material mass uh, leads to a change in the oscillation amplitudes, uh, as well as uh, change in the, oh, in the phase shift between the rotating exciters. Uh, so the change in the material mass can lead to a jump uh, into the buff resonant uh, frequency range. So uh, <clears throat> this slide shows a similar characteristics of uh, for vibration with a contact with a limiter, which is mounted with a, with a certain clearance. Uh, shown here. <clears throat> As we can see that uh, in the resonant frequency range, which is here, uh, a change in the material mass leads to insignificant change in the vibration amplitudes. And uh, we can see that uh, contact with the limiter helps to stabilize the phase shift uh, near the 180 degrees, which corresponds uh, to anti-phase synchronous rotation of vibrational exciters, and as well as to reduce uh, its sensitivity to change it, uh, to the mass change. So in this, uh, uh, so this slide shows similar characteristics uh, with the average value of the material mass uh, for different values of the initial clearance. Uh, 
shown here. It can be seen that uh, the decrease in the clearance lead to stabilization of the phase shift near the 180 degrees. And, uh, but, but it uh, leads to, de to decrease, uh, to decrease uh, vibration amplitudes. Uh, this slide shows the results of simulation uh, vibrations of the machine with the limiter when excited uh, at resonance. Yeah, the resonance uh, with the frequency shown here. And then the material mass uh, changed slowly uh, in time. Uh, this figure shows the oscillations. Uh, oscillograms of vertical oscillations of the working element uh, at the maximum value of uh, mass of the material, average value and uh, without material of the working element. So we can see that uh, change in mass lead to uh, some change in uh, uh, vibration mode, which can be seen from here and here. But uh, it uh, practically no effect on vibration amplitudes. However, there are no oscillation jumps occur as it was observed uh, in the system without uh, without a limiter. So, for conclusion, we can say that the introduction of an elastic limiter helps to stabilize the synchronous antiphase uh, rotational mode of a vibration excitus in the frequency range near the second resonance, as well as uh, lead to a significant decrease in the sensitivity of the vibration amplitudes to change in the process material mass. So tuning to the resonance mode can be carried out only due to the rational choice of the elastic limiter parameters without the use of the excitation frequency control system. And the value of clearance between the limiter and the working element significantly affect both on the vibration amplitudes and on the frequency range boundaries of the required vibrational modes and can be used as one of the adjustable parameters uh, in the development of uh, controlled resonant vibrating machines. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Professor Cartmel. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting presentation. <clears throat> um, can I, may I ask a question about slide six, please? Slide six, yes. Please, yes. This one. Uh, sorry, the, the page before that. Yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, is this a mass ratio effect, um, which is a f operating as a detuning of the system? Um, because your, your mu values, mu W, are changing from red to blue. Um, is mu W a mass ratio or is it a... Uh, a mass of the payload, for example, the material. Mu W is a, a ratio of uh, material mass, which is uh, process, process material mass. Okay. To yeah. the uh, mass of the working element. Uh, okay. Usually it's a platform of the, work, of the machine. Okay, thank you. So it's a, it detunes the system and you get it is a detuning effect, I guess. Yes. Uh, I don't understand clearly. Um, so I'm sorry. Excuse me. It, it changes the resonant characteristics of the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it, it yeah. So, the, uh, not only resonant, but also uh, on phase. phase. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But on page seven, the next page, yes. this effect is less. Is much less because of different clearance, I suppose. Uh, this effect uh, is because of the contact with the limiter. Uh, on the slide six, these yep. characteristics are for the uh, vibrations uh, without contact with the limiter. 
which is the usual situation for vibrating machine, uh, which has uh, with, uh, which has linearly elastic suspensions. Okay. And uh, to uh, stabilize uh, phase shift and uh, oscillations uh, in the uh, resonant frequency range, uh, we uh, research the influence of the effect of the elastic uh, vibration limiter uh, on the on these characteristics in phase shift and, and uh, amplitudes and uh, found that uh, yeah, and, and uh, about uh, the vibration amplitudes it's uh, exactly well uh, it's a known effect yes mm -hmm. but uh, for the phase shift uh, <clears throat> that I mean that uh, the introduction of the limit uh, stabilizes the phase shift uh, in this region too. Uh, this is uh, uh, the effect which we uh, wanted to found and uh, found it. Thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have also a small question to your slide number six. Yes. If we take mu w equal to zero, it means there is no uh, interaction with this uh, upper mass. Yes, exactly. Uh, there is no material uh, on the platform. With, no interaction with the material, yes. Yeah. Um, somehow, your uh, picture of the y max and y min, uh, min is not symmetrical with respect to zero. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is because the gravity force is taken. Take okay, it is because of the gravity force. And what is uh, the reason that you um, don't represent uh, the dots close to omega equal to one. There seem to be something, uh, some gap in your lines. Exactly. We see, where is the gap? As you can see, between... not in the vertical, uh, not in the vertical uh, direction, in the horizontal. Or oh, there is no. Uh, it's uh, because of your red line. I don't see probably some I... dots. Okay, I'll try to delete them. If if it is possible, <laughs> of course. Uh, okay, uh, exactly where is the gap, uh, which means the jump uh, uh, beyond the resonance. Uh, then the part of, uh, these characteristics were obtained uh, uh, at uh, slowly changing uh, frequency of the power supply, power <laughs> supply to the motors and uh, <laughs> of course, we uh, obtained uh, jumps uh, when passing the resonance. Uh, it clearly can be seen, for example, uh, for the graphs with, uh, uh, described by, uh, mm -hmm. by uh, squares, for example. Mm -hmm. squares. Here you can see the jump. Yes, but what happens between, within these gaps? What happens within these gaps? Yes. Uh, we uh, we did not uh, uh, okay. Uh, we didn't have the solution uh, in these gaps. Uh, we uh, uh, this is because this characteristic was uh, obtained only when the only at increasing uh, the power supply frequency. Of course, if we uh, um, simulate uh, at decreasing uh, power supply frequency, we will find some maybe stable uh, modes here. OK. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? seems to be not the case. We have a very long session today for three hours. So 
uh, I thank everyone for their patience. And we continue with our next speaker. It is Professor Andrievsky. And the title of uh, his talk is Mechatronic Vibration Setup Experiments on Synchronization and Control. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the introduction. Uh, please let me uh, show my presentation. Professor Andreevsky, we cannot hear anything. We can see your screen, but we don't have any sound. Um, uh, if you speak, we hear you, but if you... Uh, Use your video, we don't hear you. No, no sound. No sound. Okay, okay. Uh, so let me please uh, start again. Uh, um, uh, my screen is visible now. Uh, is it visible? Yes, I see. Yes, okay. And uh, sound, okay? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Uh, so let, let's try uh, begin. Uh, the talk is mechatronic vibrational setup, experiment on synchronization and control. Uh, the talk uh, was, uh, was prepared by Boris Andreevsky, gentlemen with Alexander Fatkov and uh, Vladimir Baikov in the Institute for Problems of Mechanical Engineering of Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, mechatronic laboratory setup, SV2M, of the IPME was developed in the, on the basis of many years of experiments of creating vibrating stands as a mechanical engineering and the IPME. It should be emphasized that Professor Blackman was among the initiators of the development of the stand. He outlined the range of its possible applications in research works on vibration technologies 
The mechanical is an phenomena and oscillation synchronization. Uh, Professor Blackman had paid great attention to the works performed on the setup, actually participated in the discussion, helped interpretation of the experimental results, and had suggested the directions for further research. Uh, the MMMS includes vibrational strength, electrical motors, sensors, personal computer. All the devices constitute an integrated system where the electrical and mechanical processes are closely, closely linked each other. A uh, general uh, view of the setup is shown in this slide. The mechanical part, uh, uh, personal computer, and the electrical uh, setup. Mechanical, mechanical part, part is an electrically driven vibrational device. Uh, it includes inductions, induction motors, support frame, spring, additional frame, and unbalanced rotors. A key part of the me mechanical part of the system is a pair of unbalanced actuators. Each actuator includes three phase induction motor with computer control rotation velocity, the unbalanced rotor, which rotates on the motor shaft. Unbalance of the rotor is provided by the eccentrically located weight. The drive shaft shaft at the anti-vibration screw springs reduce the vibration transmission to the frame and, and to the bezel. The additional platform is mounted on the springs for installing the additional weight. Uh, sensors. Twelve optical sensors measuring the linear displacement of, of both platforms are installed. The sensor data allows to obtain information about the six degree of freedom linear and angular coordinates of the platform. Two or three axis accelerometers are installed on each platform. Motor rotors are equipped with encoder measuring the increments of rotor angles in the amount of uh, 4,000 bits per resolution. Uh, in this scheme, uh, positions of sensors on the of the main platform are demonstrated. Control of phase shift and vibrational fields. If the different points of the supporting platform oscillate along different trajectories, the field of vibration vibrations is non-uniform, as explained in this handbook. Ensuring an appropriate vibrational field of the platform is important for bulk material transportation. The self synchronization phenomenon without kinematic connection between the actuators may be used as is suggested in the paper by Blackman, Fatkov, and Mayor Pagrovsky. Uh, additional possibilities of the, uh, this uh, setup. Uh, feedback control, ensuring specific size, size, steady phase difference between the rotors. The drive system. If we are in the open loop by applying constant control signals of various levels to the drive system. Systems. So this uh, led to the following partition of the rotation frequency. Lower frequencies, uh, the significant impact of gravitational pendular torque to the motors is observed on this uh, frequency range. Medium frequencies from 30 to 70 radians per second, high frequencies up to 100 radians per, per second, and super frequencies uh, greater than 100 radians per, per second. On these frequencies, uh, is very strong interaction between the rotated debalances and movements of the platform, platform is observed. Uh, close to omega 125 five radians per second, Sommerfeld effect ma manifests itself. Low and superior frequencies are not considered in this in medium and high frequency ranges, the averaging property is varied, fast oscillating components are averaged, and only the slow motions may be taken into account. The system, which, which includes 
induction motor, frequency converter, and a local controller dynamics uh, is uh, maybe approximately described by the following transfer function. Uh, standard recursive LSC method was used to find the system model parameters. It was obtained that variations of model parameters for different regions of the, of the base frequency are small. So the average values, uh, following average values, were, were taken for further research. For enjoying the prescribed phase shift between uh, left and right rotors and speed uh, of uh, rotation speed. In, in this uh, kind of uh, series of experiments, uh, rotation speeds for left and right rotors uh, are, are, are given to be equal. First, feedback control of rotor angular velocities. Uh, uh, this control law is used to stabilize rotor velocities around given uh, prescribed values, omega asterisk. Uh, here, omega asterisk are reference angular velocities, actual velocities, control signals, and uh, controller parameters. Uh, the second uh, algorithm uh, is used for feedback control of the phase shift and angular velocities simultaneously. Uh, it is ensured uh, mm, by cross coupling between the drives by introducing uh, con uh, phase control sigma u c. Uh, it is subtracted from the uh, control signal to the left motor and add it to the control signal of the right motor. Uh, this uh, signal is um, generated by uh, phase controller. Uh, and this uh, controller, so called sign modification, is used instead of uh, linear. Uh, a linear um, error because it's not uh, important how many how many revolves uh, there between uh, the rotors. Uh, we are interested on the uh, displacement in the range of uh, plus minus p radians. Uh, control backboard diagram is presented in this slide. Uh, uh, left and right device systems, P omega controllers, and uh, phase controller, and this additional signals, uh, which are applied from uh, phase controller to, to the drive system. Experimental results uh, for phase shift control are as follows. Uh, in low frequency, uh, about 30 radians per second, angular velocity and phase, phase shift errors are re relatively high due to the significant impact of the debalanced torque to the drives. Medium frequency, uh, about 60 radians per second, both frequency and phase shift errors are not significant. Uh, in the high frequency range, uh, if uh, of C asterisk is uh, set to T radians, the desired phase shift can be ensured since control action is unable to overcome the tendency of self-centralization in phase of the unbalanced rotors. rotors revolving with a high velocity. Uh, for omega uh, equal to 60 radians per second, the following research figures of platform oscillations uh, were obtained. Uh, case 
C is, is equal to zero. C uh, of P returns. Uh, then uh, three um, pot P returns and uh, finally P returns. So uh, we can see that the motion of the platform is uh, regular. But uh, the different kind of motion, uh, vertical or horizontal, uh, may be obtained. Uh, but if uh, omega is taken uh, significantly uh, large, 80 radians per second, then for C equal to zero, uh, the regular oscillations of the platform are obtained. But uh, if C given C is P, uh, the oscillations are not regular. So we um, refer to this case as uh, impossibility to uh, ensure the given phase shift between uh, process. A summarizing diagram uh, and then we the elements are uh, omega from 70 to 120 per second, and uh, that uh, first shift between rotors from zero to, uh, to, uh, to the region. Uh, green <coughs> field showed, uh, the, show, shows uh, the pairs of omega and C were given uh, C may be inserted. Red, a stable rotation is a given C is not possible, and yellow, intermediate domain. The problem of control synchronization for endurance rotors phase shift is considered. The control laws for frequency stabilization, along with the prescribed phase shift between the rotor angular positions, are proposed and experimentally studied to the mechatronic vibration stand SV2M. It's obtained that for the low and medium frequencies, the self synchronization of endurance rotors doesn't prevent ensuring, ensuring the desired phase shift between the rotors. For a high frequency, well, frequency band, the Hagen's self synchronization of rotors manifests itself narrowing the range of the achievable phase shift. Nevertheless, for all the frequency, frequencies, less than the frequency of the first effect, the desired phase shift in the range of uh, half P uh, radians uh, can be ensured. Uh, some papers where this setup and uh, simulation, simulation and experimental results uh, uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Andreevsky. Are there any questions? I have one. Uh, Yes, please. Uh, yes. Uh, could you explain uh, how do you estimate uh, phase shift? Uh, do you take uh, average value during the revolution or in continuous mode? Uh, sure. About estimation phase shift? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Because you have. Uh, 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 yes. Because we use uh, encoders with uh, very high resolution, and uh, in practice, uh, they give a lot of noise because of um, um, the rotation of the uh, rotor. We have, we have taken a phase shift uh, on a 2P model. So we have made uh, projections of the um, Phase angle to the um, maybe in difference between phase shift uh, 
to the interval from zero to two p. Oh, well, I mean, uh, okay. do, you, do you use yeah. uh, do you well, use an averaged value for your control system, or uh, it's uh, continue uh, permanently uh, measures and uh, control? Um, uh, I can see. Uh, I can see the continual body except my presentation, so it will be difficult for me to uh, to answer the question. Uh, uh, please, uh, can you please uh, ask me again? Uh, you you use uh, very uh, um, you use encoders with very high resolution. Uh, uh, you and for your control system. Uh, usually, uh, rotors rotate uh, uneven with uh, v, uh, uh, revolution uh, speed, rotational speed uh, change during the one during e uh, during each revolution, and of course the phase shift uh, change too. You take uh, for your control system. You take an average value uh, for uh, controlling or uh, you uh, make some approximation, I don't know. Uh, uh, firstly, we have used uh, same, same modification of the control. So uh, uh, the absolute value of uh, difference uh, Difference is not important. No, it is, it is not, uh, not the question. The question is how you measure uh, the phase difference. Uh, measure uh, phase, phase? The phase ang angle. Yes. yes. Um, by uh, what? By means of uh, encoders, uh, which uh, established on the rotor. Yes, encoders. Uh, uh, yes. If uh, the uh, number is too large, um, we um, have uh, set it to zero uh, the amount, uh, the total amount of the increment of the angle. It uh, may be done um, by uh, electronic. Uh, okay. Right. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Okay. So uh, I uh, have to stop this discussion and perhaps you can communicate uh, via the private chat here, which is uh, offered by Zoom. Okay. Yes, okay. I'm sorry for that. And I have to introduce our next speaker. It is mm -hmm. Professor Kostin. I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes. Mm, thank you. Uh, and the title of his talk is Energy Optimal Control by Boundary Forces for Longitudinal Vibrations of an Elastic Rod. Can you uh, see my presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, dear Chairman, dear colleagues, thank you very much for your uh, kind presentation and invitation to, to take part in this section. And uh, of course, my uh, study is devoted to uh, control of uh, elastic system, but uh, of course, vibration is B here. And uh, we uh, consider a very simple uh, dynamic uh, system with distributed parameter, elastic root, uh, but find some mm, uh, optimal control and explicit uh, way what is important for uh, general characteristic of such uh, distribu distributed vibration system. Let's consider the uh, initial uh, boundary value problem, uh, which can describe in the term of absolute displacement of the root points. V is uh, this uh, field and uh, Rho and uh, Kappa is a uh, uh, <clears throat> linear density and uh, stiffness of this road. So we suppose that a road can move uh, in X direction and uh, loaded by external uh, forces, F plus and minus on both end. So we have a uh, vector control here, vector uh, in the sense of inputs and uh, uh, 
uh, initial condition is given, uh, then we can uh, describe the uh, full motion of the system. Uh, the, our purpose to find such uh, forces, which minimize some functional, we uh, will discuss a little bit later. To uh, describe this problem in some uh, variational term, we uh, need uh, to introduce some new variables for, for the system. This is uh, rather clear dynamic uh, parameters of the system. This is P. P is uh, the momentum density of the root and S is the normal, C, uh, normal forces in the uh, root cross section. In uh, these terms, we can write down the balance equations, Newton's second law, uh, related uh, momentum density and uh, uh, normal forces, uh, and uh, uh, describe the system also in the terms of constitutive relation. Uh, which uh, connected the moment, uh, momentum density P and the velocity of the system, as well as uh, the normal forces and uh, <coughs> uh, strains in the uh, road materials. Initial and the boundary condition can be also rewrite in this term. Then we have on the boundary, the um, uh, normal forces expressed through the external uh, forces. Uh, here, uh, we introduce a uh, new uh, distribution of the momentum, P0 through the old velocity distribution. The next step to simplify this system, to introduce some potential, uh, so-called potential dynamic variables, which uh, mm, uh, can be uh, uh, the momentum density and uh, normal forces can be expressed through the derivatives of this uh, new variable. And then we can uh, uh, equate uh, the, the balance equation. So the balance equation uh, is now a DCP from the system. The constitutive relation is a two uh, equation of the first order. Uh, seven is describe this relation between R, the function of potential, and V, the displacement of the system. In this term, we also can rewrite the um, uh, in, initial and boundary condition. So uh, now we have the problem with two variables, V and R. Uh, and of course, uh, because of integration in the system, we receive some arbitrary constant C0. This uh, C0 uh, uh, does not depend on, uh, does not influence on the uh, state of the road, but can be chose arbitrary. So we, uh, in what follow, can uh, equate uh, can equate it, equate this uh, constant to zero. Next uh, step, we can uh, reduce our constitutive relation, uh, local constitutive relation, by one uh, integral relation, or reduce this problem because of our so-called integral differential approach to minimization problem. We need to minimize to absolute minimum zero minimum the uh, constitutive function of Q, which is quadratic form from the uh, residual of constitutive uh, relations. So this is uh, left uh, uh, part of this constitutive equation in some uh, scaling uh, coefficient. And then in the, as a result, we receive some uh, estimation of error in our system if we use the approximate solution, or if we have exact solution, this uh, constitutive functional is equal to zero. But in this statement, uh, we extend the space of our uh, variable V and R, now in Hilbert space, uh, Sobola space. And uh, in what follow, we can prove that for our initial and uh, boundary condition, uh, this uh, variable is also continuous. So we can use some approach, uh, which I can explain, uh, explain you in detail later. So uh, essential initial and boundary condition is now initial distribution of uh, displacement, initial distribution of dynamic variable, and uh, uh, boundary values of this uh, dynamic variable on the bound on, uh, uh, on the boundary. We when we have some new control a function u, which is also continuous. Uh, uh, here I consider only uh, uh, 
uniform elastic road. And for this uh, uniform road, we can introduce dimensionless parameters and uh, reduce the system to dimensionless form. Now we have uh, <coughs> integral differential problem. Q equal to zero, this is integral uh, constitutive relation and initial and boundary condition all combined in uh, formula 13. After that, uh, I can uh, stay at the control problem. We uh, should find uh, uh, some function u plus and u minus, and also constant c1, which is uh, appear in, uh, sorry, p in the terminal condition. Uh, so we should find a function of control u plus u minus constant c1, which minimizes the functional g, which is a uh, weighted sum of uh, control norm, as well as a mean energy. E is a mean energy and uh, control norm is a quadratic integral uh, square of this norm is a integral over time the quadrat of the control function. The uh, mean energy uh, described in term of our known function, more exactly in, uh, in term of derivatives of this function. As a terminal condition, we consider some distribution of the displacement and uh, our dynam new dynamic function. And in this uh, uh, terminal condition for dynamics function, appears some constant after integration over the momentum density. Terminal uh, P1 is a uh, terminal distribution of momentum. So we have some additional uh, uh, constant for optimization. We would like to find some mm, control which uh, minimizes with some weight, uh, the mean energy stored in the system, as well as a norm of the uh, control function. Essential constraint in this uh, control problem is uh, integral equation for um, constitutive relation, Q should be equal to zero, uh, initial distribution of uh, V and R, and also the boundary condition on the function R. Uh, to solve this problem, we use uh, Delamere representation and uh, express our unknown function through traveling waves. This is well-known approach, and uh, using this approach, we can prove that, according to Sobolev's lemma, that if a control function v, u, u, plus and u minus, as well as initial distribution v0 and r0 is continuous, we receive the continuous uh, traveling waves as well. Uh, and through the linear mm, uh, expression of uh, our unknown function vr, uh, the function v and r are, are also continuous. Uh, in what follow, we will use a characteristic uh, coordinates as I, uh, that plus and that minus. For convenience, we uh, introduce some representation of time horizon. We suppose that uh, our control uh, is found all over some fixed time horizon, T capital, which uh, can be expressed through the uh, dimensionless uh, length of the road. This is two. Uh, and uh, tau zero is some parameter of uh, mm, rest of division of the lens, dimensionless uh, lens of the road, two by uh, uh, divided by, by time, T capital. Um, to uh, solve this problem, we have a solution uh, this, of this problem, of course, but uh, uh, we should also satisfy uh, initial and boundary condition and also terminal condition to find the all possible solution for this problem. For that, we introduce some indexing traveling ways as well as indexing control function. This is all expression of our mm, unknown traveling waves uh, through the uh, function with some shift. So this uh, new function with index uh, W plus minus uh, I, is uh, defined on some uh, mm, mesh which uh, generated by a characteristic uh, 
origin from the corner of the space-time domain. In this space-time domain representation, we uh, can uh, resolve uh, initial terminal and boundary condition through some part of uh, traveling vein indexing functions, as well as uh, uh, all control functions. So we express our solution not from, uh, not through the control function, but through the unknown uh, uh, traveling waves. The group of these unknown free functions, free traveling waves, uh, can be grouped in two vectors, which is uh, differ by the uh, mm, uh, domain of uh, this function. So uh, if we return to the mesh, we have uh, some mm, uh, distance for traveling way with shift defined on the interval zero tau zero and zero tau one, which is uh, complementary to the zero tau. And uh, for these two, um, uh, two type of domains, we uh, can uh, form uh, two uh, vector valued function y0 and y1, which is unknown in this problem. So uh, this is solution and uh, formula 17 show us the space of this solution. All uh, continuous function in this uh, sets, two sets, uh, give us different solution for of direct problem, of uh, direct problem with uh, terminal condition. And after that, we should satisfy also some uh, inter-function uh, continuity condition, which is described by formula 18. Uh, in vector form, this uh, continuity condition uh, show in this uh, formula 19. After that, we can substitute uh, all this solution in our functional, and it uh, can be shown that the all part is functional is a quadratic uh, form with respect to the uh, first derivatives of traveling waves, unknown traveling waves. Uh, we also have some decomposition of our mean energy functional into two parts. First part is uh, depend on the left traveling waves and second depend on the uh, right seven uh, traveling waves. Uh, more or, uh, of, uh, we have also some decomposition of this uh, uh, mean energy functional into two parts. One part depends on the initial and terminal condition, and another part, uh, variable part, depends on the unknown uh, function w plus minus i. Uh, so we have uh, some quadratic functional, of course, but it, uh, its uh, structure can be described as shown in uh, formula 23. This uh, functional, uh, this variable part of this functional uh, is quadratic form of uh, derivatives of our unknown uh, vector valued function y1 and y0 and y1. Uh, this means that uh, uh, we can reduce our optimal control problem two dimensional in space and time to one dimensional problem. Uh, and this is a uh, mm, rather classical variational problem. We should minimize the functional j that, uh, tilde, which is quadratic with respect to a known function y0 uh, and y1. Uh, we minimize this function over all possible function y0, y1, and constant c1, which appear from the terminal condition. And we have also uh, some constraint uh, so essential constraint from continuity condition. As a result, we can find euler ragrams equation, uh, conjugate vectors also shown by 26. And uh, variation on the boundary is not so simple, but we can describe it in terms of variation of unknown function. Uh, after that, taking into account the linear combination which of variation of, of the unknown function on the boundary uh, from the essential condition, we uh, receive some expression for the variation of the terminal constant. After that, we can exclude this uh, uh, variation from our expression for the unknown uh, function. Uh, 
and receive some com linear combination of constraint on the variation of this function. Using this linear uh, relation, we can express the mm, <clears throat> natural condition imposed on the unknown conjugate uh, vectors P0 and P1. And after that, receive uh, the result, some uh, system of necessary condition on the externals. Here in formula 33, it's uh, seen that this uh, equation can be solved uh, directly by integration of our differential equation. The general solution is uh, uh, linear polynomials plus some uh, uh, right hand sides, which is uh, generated by initial internal condition. So this system can be proved that we have uh, also unique solution. And uh, as a result, we can receive uh, the pattern of optimal control for arbitrary initial internal condition. Uh, this uh, solu optimal solution for an finite distributed system received by uh, some um, solution of ordinary differential equation and can be expressed uh, explicitly. And so I can show you the result of our uh, optimization. So for example, uh, if I uh, remember that gamma is a weighting coefficient and if gamma is negative, that we try to minimize uh, energy stored in the system. If gamma is positive or large enough, that we try to minimize our control function. So, on the left, we have uh, energy minimization, and we can see that uh, this is a distribution of displacement in the road that we try to depress our vibrations in the system first and then move to the terminal position with some uh, uh, not uh, energy uh, expensive uh, way. Uh, vice versa, if we try to minimize the um, control function, then the vibration of the system are always uh, high during the process. But um, when we um, uh, consider the control function, we can see on the slide on the left, that this is control from both sides from the end of this road, uh, which is optimal from the point of view of energy. So first we uh, spent a lot of uh, control effort uh, to suppress vibration. This is uh, amplitude approximately equal to two uh, in dimensionless parameter. But when we optimize a, a control uh, norm, we have uh, intensive control during all process, but uh, the amplitude is twice less. Uh, here is uh, in the previous slide, uh, we have the values of uh, our functional. First functional is a uh, square of uh, control norm is equal to two for energy minimization and E is equal to, the mean energy is also equal to approximately two. After change the weighting coefficient to the uh, minimization of control, we receive twice less uh, control norm and uh, more than twice energy in the system. Uh, as an end, we can see the analysis of the energy functional and control functional uh, depending on the parameter of control. Gamma is a weighting coefficient and T is a time of control. Uh, you can see that uh, if gamma is negative, then we minimize energy. Then energy is decreasing when increasing the time of control. And when uh, gamma is positive, the norm of control increasing monotonically, why we increasing uh, time, we increase the time of the control. In the middle, we have some uh, play of the parameter. And so we can choose such uh, control strategy, which can increase both uh, energy in the system and the uh, norm of our functional. This is all. Uh, the short uh, uh, conclusion is on this slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kostin. Are there any questions? Or comments? Perhaps a very short question from my side. Yes. What is uh, the objective of your uh, 
control. Do you want to minimize the vibrations at a certain point in general, or is there any other uh, real objective? Uh, the, we have two objectives. First, we, uh, of course, waiting objective. We can yes. uh, find a compromise between the norm of the control. It should be some square inter integral mm -hmm. over time of the square. So, for example, the uh, power of our forces, if it's quadratic, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, we try to uh, minimize the mean energy, so uh, mean vibration inside the road during the process, the, not the uh, terminal uh, vibration, but mm -hmm. the uh, vibration during the motion. So all over mm -hmm. the process. So you, on this slide, you can see the amplitude in time and uh, space. Of course, in the middle, somehow when the gamma is close to zero, we can uh, decrease increasing time, for example, of control, decrease both norm mm -hmm. of the problem of the uh, control and energy uh, stored in the system. OK. This. And uh, uh, these vibrations, which you try to minimize in the whole history of your uh, process, is it excited by the initial conditions? Uh, Certainly, if we have, we only have by initial conditions. Yes, yes, we have zero initial condition. We can stop, uh, or maybe we have problem when we can try to move the road from one position, zero state, to another rest mm -hmm. state. Then we cannot cannot avoid some vibrations in the system during the motion. Mm -hmm. We can minimize this vibration. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? It seems to be not the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think I'm the last speaker in this uh, session before the coffee break. Uh, probably as an information for everybody, Professor Katmel has left us until six o'clock uh, Moscow time. And the question is if there is uh, anybody who doesn't understand Russian. It seems that everybody understands Russian. Uh, I uh, will nevertheless uh, speak in English because it is uh, recorded and uh, probably Professor Katnal can uh, look at the, uh, uh, the recorded part of the session, but if you want to ask a question, you can ask me in English or in Russian or anyway. Mm. Then I'll try to share my screen. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yes. 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 OK. Yeah. Um, there will be one video where you probably won't hear the um, uh, sound, but it doesn't matter. I will, ex I will explain what you hear here, uh, what you see here. Uh, so the title of my uh, talk is Systems with Partially Strong damped variables in engineering from Sommerfeld effects to escape dynamics. And I have a lot of uh, co-authors, which I will present uh, in the, at the end of my presentation. Um, what I'm going to talk about is actually something what Blechmann did at the very beginning of his uh, scientific life. And uh, he gave an explanation of the Sommerfeld effect. And uh, doing that, he uh, used some physically motivated uh, assumptions, which are very, have a very long life and can have strong impact on the understanding of uh, di the dynamics of different engineering systems, both uh, in the former times and now and I think also in future. 
So I will give some examples uh, how this approach can be generalized and used in some different systems, both related to uh, rotating machines or unbalanced rotating machines, but also completely different, uh, of completely different nature, uh, like dry friction, uh, hydraulic valves, or escape dynam dynamics in microsystems. Uh, let us start with Sommerfeld effect. Uh, actually, Arnold uh, Sommerfeld was uh, a very important German physicist. He worked in Munich, and he is mainly known for his work in the uh, foundations of the modern physics. Uh, there are very many anecdotes connected with his person, but one is uh, definitely very doubtful uh, record, world record. He was 81 times nominated for the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize. And it is uh, a world record for people who never got it. Nevertheless, uh, seven of his former graded or postgraduate students have obtained the Nobel Prize, among them Heisenberg, Pauli, Beete, uh, Deby, and Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling uh, got it twice in chemistry and uh, uh, in uh, the Peace Nobel Prize. But uh, Sommerfeld was also a very practical person. And uh, 1902, he has described an observation uh, that an unbalanced rotor placed on a flexible table and accelerated uh, by a DC as a direct current motor, uh, passing through the resonance of the carrier system stopped to accelerate and the amplitude of its vibrations increased dramatically. Only due to a strong increase of the applied current, Sommerfeld succeeded to bring the rotor to the objected speed, uh, which was accompanied by a specific jump phenomenon. Sommerfeld did not give any explanation of the effect. He considered it uh, from the practical point of view as an example of the unnecessary energy waste. Uh, it is very easy to demonstrate the Sommerfeld effect. What you see here is a milk frother. It's a machine to create milk foam. And if you start it, uh, it doesn't pass through the resonance. You can bring it through the resonance uh, by changing the initial conditions or bring it to uh, strong vibrations if you change the initial conditions once more. It's quite easy to demonstrate. Um, you see here the diagram, which is copied from the original paper of 1902. And um, now we are coming to Blechmann. He gave the explanation of this effect 1953. It was not his first work on nonlinear dynamics. The first one was uh, on the uh, regular uh, control system of Boisa Sada. Uh, but uh, he used a very specific approach to explain this effect. Um, actually, he used uh, the Poincaré method. Uh, to investigate the stability of the corresponding periodic solutions. But uh, not for, uh, to the full system. He supposed that uh, in the unperturbed state, the rotor speed is constant. And he used the pure force solution for the oscillations of the carrier system. Uh, please note that at that time, asymptotic methods were not invented yet. Neither averaging nor the singular perturbation techniques were established. Uh, just two years uh, before, uh, Kapitza has published his first paper on the pendulum with the vibrating suspension point. Uh, so this approach which Blechmann used was more or less physically motivated without any mathematical background. Uh, What you see here 
are equations of motion. And uh, in this equation, there are two equations. The first one is for the vibrations of, uh, of for, the, for the rotation of the rotor. And the second one is uh, for the vibrations of the carrier system. And there are two points which you have to pay your attention. The first one is the characteristic of the uh, DC motor, which is the first uh, term on the right-hand side of the first equation. And uh, it is assumed to be linear and depend on the rotation speed. The second important point here is the damping. Actually, you assume here that the damping described by the uh, coefficient d is not small. And uh, what Blechman did, he replaced uh, the second equation by its pure force solution, ignoring the initial conditions, and then put it into the equation for the rotor, convert it to the uh, speed of the rotor and its angle as a new independent variable, and average this equation, which leads to the uh, very well known uh, equation describing the Sommerfeld effect. Uh, the main result was that there are different cases. For example, it is possible that the system has three solutions. The first one is unstable and is below the resonance. The second one, uh, the first one is stable. The second one is unstable and is close uh, slightly above the resonance. And the third one is the objective solution. And because of the stability of the first solution, uh, systems don't pass through the resonance. The first important generalization was made by uh, Blechman's scholar of the first generation by Kamil Shamsudinovich Hadraev, who noticed that actually the static characteristic of the rotor, of the electric uh, DC motor, is not correct. Actually, you have to write the equation uh, of the electric part of the system, which is done here in this slide. And you have a fully coupled system with mechanical and electrical compounds. But if you assume that the electrical resistance in the electrical part of the system is large, then you can use the same type of approximation which Blechmann used for mechanical vibrations and say, replace the dynamics of the current through its stationary solution, which leads to this static uh, characteristic of the DC motor. This is, uh, leads to the Blechmann's equations and the whole procedure is, uh, can be continued. Uh, the next, point I would uh, like to talk about is the mathematical background, the modern mathematical background of this approach. It says following, if we have a system with partially strongly damped variables, you have two types of variables here. X are uh, the weakly damped variables and Ys are the strongly damped variables. Then uh, you can rewrite it uh, as a singularly perturbed system. It doesn't matter. The main assumption is that the logarithmic norm of the matrix K is equal to minus one. Or uh, it doesn't mean exactly minus one. It means actually that it is a negative value, which is not small. And uh, under these assumptions, you can uh, develop a, uh, uh, an asymptotic uh, solution for this system. And the main point is that you can actually neglect the damped variables, the strongly damped variables, and uh, replace them by zero. 
this is the math mathematical basic, but uh, in many cases, it's not quite easy to transform uh, the real system to such a form. Here I give, without any mathematics, several examples uh, which show how this approach works in applications. For example, here you see self-balancing devices which were investigated also by Blechmann. They are used nowadays in washing machines or in medical centrifuges where you uh, can't uh, predict the unbalance. With this approach, in, uh, investigating the passage through resonance of such system, you can find that alongside with Sommerfeld effect, which you can see in the left column, and passage through resonance, which you can see in the middle column, you can observe a different type of solutions. It is the non-stationary or slowly modulated capture into the resonance where the rotation speeds oscillates very slowly, but with large amplitudes and amplitudes of vibrations of the carrier system as oscillate also very slowly, but strongly. This type of solutions have a very large attraction domain. It is much larger than the usual Sommerfeld effect. The usual Sommerfeld is here. This whole area is the attraction domain of the slowly modulated uh, capturing into the resonance and coexists uh, co with the synchronized solution. The similar effects can be observed in uh, the passage through resonance by self-synchronizing excitors. Uh, you see here also different types of solutions. Uh, appearing by passage to resonance. You can observe capturing into the resonance. You can observe self-synchronization and you can observe non-synchronized solutions after passage through the, through the resonance. Here, another example in the completely different area, which was also strongly being influenced by Blechmann, it is smoothening of dry friction by high frequency excitation. It's a very well-known result that exciting the mass on the moving belt with a high frequency, you can smoothen the frequency, uh, the friction characteristic, transforming dry friction in some kind of nonlinear um, viscous friction. But if you perform the corresponding experiments, you observe some deviation. You see, you see here a lot of experimental results. They show the existence of this smoothening effect but it doesn't follow exactly this arc sinus uh, formula, which was derived by Blechmann. And in order to improve this prediction, you have to take the tangential compliance of the contact into account. You have to improve your friction model, which can be done in different ways. The first, and the simplest one is the dull uh, friction model more uh, precise you are with the generalized elastoplastic friction model. And this model contains internal variables, which are also strongly damped and can be in an appropriate way um, replaced by the pure force solution. The result is demonstrated here. This is the dark uh, black curve, which very well follows the experimental results. Also in hydraulics, you have these types of systems. Uh, in hy hydraulic uh, valves are extremely nonlinear. They have switching nonlinearities and they have square root uh, nonlinearities due to the properties of the edges, control edges. And they are quite difficult to analyze, but the analysis shows that there are also strongly damped fast variables. In this uh, case, it is the acceleration of the piston mass of this mass. And um, you can identify slow manifold, which is also globally asymptotically stable and uh, simplify the system, still taking switching nonlinearity into account. 
here you see a comparison of uh, exact solution, which is in blue. Uh, the reduced system using this singular perturbation technique, which is orange. And as a comparison, you see here the naive approach, uh, neglecting the mass of the piston, piston, which is black, and shows a strong deviation from the exact results. And the last example I wanted to show you is the escape of a particle from a potential well. You have here some potential well, and you excite this particle with a harmonic force. Uh, if the system is completely conservative and the uh, well is a, a quadratic one, which is simply cut away limited quadratic potential, truncated quadratic potential you see here, then you can uh, move the particle away from the well by uh, arbitrary small force if it is exactly in the resonance, because you increase the amplitude until the particle reaches the uh, edge and it goes away. That's why uh, the amplitude, the critical amplitude is actually zero. And if you uh, deviate from the exact resonance, then you have uh, these lines, the blue one and the green one, describing different mechanisms of escape. But you can also change the, your problem and consider, consider not a single particle, but uh, a group of particles, in this case, only two particles, which are connected to each other with a stiff spring and uh, damping. And the escape problem in this system is much more interesting and uh, more difficult. And the main result is that exciting this pair of particles at their own natural frequency supposing non-small damping between them, you can stabilize the whole group of these particles in the potential well. You see that the minimal force, which is necessary to move the particle out of well is larger than zero. And this is an uh, important result, for example, for microsystems, uh, where you have to stabilize Mm, particles in uh, such wells preparing medicine. There were many different uh, examples, and now I would like to uh, show you the faces of students working on these uh, problems. And the main conclusion of my talk is that we already have the third generation of Blechmann's scientific children who are active and working, continuing his ideas, developing his ideas and continuing his um, research. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, sure. Uh, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, how to say, following the line of uh, uh, research and the interest, which very uh, uh, well well correspond to the uh, topic of uh, today's session. And um, could you show the slide number eighteen? Again, eighteen. Yep. Yes. With a double. Um, no, with, with nineteen. Uh, escape, escape. Uh, no, no, no. Eighteen. No. Okay. Eighteen. Escape mm -hmm. of the well. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that if um, this uh, the shape of the potential uh, curve is um, quadratic. Mm -hmm. uh, it um, escape can happen with arbitrary small. Mm, uh, excitation uh, of yes. disturbance. 
and um, if it is not quadratic, this is not the case. I think yes. you know. Yes. Uh, what uh, are consequences for mechanics uh, for um, uh, for for this uh, situation? Uh, when uh, we, how to say? It's, it's always good that uh, when something may happen to know that something may happen with arbitrary small changes of the environment. But if something cannot be happen, like uh, like the for um, non-quadratic potentials, uh, what um, is it good or bad for applications? Do you know? It depends some on what your uh, what your application is. Uh, if you are talking about macroscopic systems like sloshing uh, in the ships, yes, which can be described in a similar way, then surely it's better uh, to avoid uh, extremely gross, uh, extremely large vibrations, and uh, to avoid the resonant excitation with the arbitrary small amplitude. If you are talking about producing of medicine, where you put one molecule on top of another one, uh, you have uh, you need some kind of uh, I would say threshold. You excite the system to a certain way to put the new molecule on top of the those which are already in this potential well. But you don't want to, uh, the whole uh, conglomerate to uh, come out of the potential well. So you need uh, some a way to choose the proper excitation. And you cannot, uh, it depends strongly on your application. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's very interesting. And my, just small comment that. Um, um, in uh, many cases, for this uh, one degree of freedom uh, system, uh, there, agrees, uh, there exists a uh, uh, way to um, escape with uh, arbitrarily small mm -hmm. input, even for this uh, non-quadratic potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Yes, there are two main mechanisms of uh, escape, yes. Uh, so-called maximum mechanism and settle point mechanism. And depending on the mechanism, you can achieve it also uh, with non-quadratic uh, well. Okay. The interesting point for the couple of particles is that the mechanism is completely different and uh, more or less uh, stochastic because even with the quadratic potential, if one of the particles is coming out of the well, the frequency changes uh, at once. And mm -hmm. then uh, you cannot move the couple of particles, the center of mass out of the well by pure uh, resonant excitation because your frequency changes. And this is the main effect here. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? If it is not the case, I would like to close this part of the session. And even if we are out of time, I suggest uh, to give people a 10, ten minutes Coffee break. Is that okay? Uh, suggestion: ten minutes break, and then we start um, the next session at uh, thirty-five minutes past uh, five. Yes, Moscow and, time. And you will overtake the yes. control, the chair. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Now it's time to continue our um, second half of a special session dedicated to the memory of uh, Professor Brechman. Um, 
uh, initially we uh, planned uh, this session, the second half of the session, if possible, to plan such events at all. Uh, we planned it as a free discussion, uh, reminiscences about uh, Ilya Israelich and uh, uh, some uh, words uh, from people who knew him. And uh, of course, uh, it would be much uh, easier to do it in Russian. Um, but we uh, understand that somebody may uh, present uh, who doesn't know Russian or uh, prefers to uh, uh, to listen in English. Uh, so we uh, we. Uh, wrote uh, two languages, two working languages, languages for, this, uh, for this session. That's why uh, even uh, if we have two uh, scientific talks uh, in the beginning, uh, we may, uh, the, the, the speakers may speak in uh, any language, either in uh, English or in Russian. I think it's uh, uh, will not create uh, problems to, to people here. So, um, according to our problem, or oh, sorry, our program, uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor Filipenko. Is uh, Professor Filipenko here? Yes, he is. Okay. Yes, I'm. <laughs> Would you like to share your screen? Okay. Mm -hmm. Please. One question, uh, Russian or English variant? <laughs> yeah. Any language, uh, according to the announcement, any language, as it is convenient for you. If uh, somebody uh, prefers English, uh. no, there is no uh, voice about uh, English preference. Так что можете по-русски говорить. Хорошо, хорошо. Ну тогда, если это не принципиально, будем пропагандировать русский язык как научный язык. Хорошо, спасибо. Спасибо за приглашение. Вот я нахожусь в политехническом как раз внутри университете. Вот. И мой доклад, совместный доклад с Татьяной Владимировной Зиновьевой из Института проблем машиноведения посвящен водородному опрубчиванию тонкостенных труб и связанные с, и, соответственно, вращение ротационные этих труб. Ну, проблема возникла, э, ну, так, широко встала сравнительно не, не, недавно, в основном с работы атомных электростанций, например, там происходит выделение водорода из воды или из носителя, и этот водород разрушает поверхность труб, в результате чего возникают разнообразные трещины, как э, трещины вдоль, так и, так сказать, э, так и вот торсионная, так скажем, трещина, да, и вот продольная трещина. Э, возникает вопрос, как предугадать э, поведение трубы со временем, как будут изменяться ее механические свойства. Э, сложность в том, что учитывать концентрацию водорода в трубе, в материале трубы достаточно сложно и до сих пор достаточно скудные все-таки экспериментальные данные по поводу вот этих данных. Поэтому возникает, соответственно, две задачи. Первая задача – это определение, соответственно, распределение водорода и изменение характеристик трубы по толщине оболочки, а другая проблема – это если мы знаем эти характеристики, то как определить, например, со временем или э, просто как определить э, сдвиг частот, который может возникать при колебании в такой оболочке, то есть уже с измененными параметрами материала. Э, 
Ну, из последних работ, вот здесь сейчас я привел такие достаточно свежие работы, вот целый ряд авторов и занимался, ну, в том числе, вот и был вклад и авторов тоже этого доклада, значит, это проблема. Теперь небольшой обзор результатов. Вот в работе Чина Жу и с авторами было показано, что как влияет водород на изменение упругих свойств трубы, а именно модуля Юнга. Вот на левом графике видно, что вот пунктирная кривая и сплошная кривая, которая отличает, соответственно, от Юнгчина, значит, труба после воздействия водорода и до, Видно, что они несколько различаются, и относительная погрешность, относительное изменение, точнее, модуля упругости порядка 2%. Ну, при других вариантах и стали, и характера проникновения водорода достаточно широких пределов может меняться этот, этот процесс, так сказать, отличина вот этого относительного отклонения. Она может Значит, ну, в среднем она где-то не больше 2%, но ну, для некоторых инновационных сплавов, например, вот такие даже рекордные значения, 25% были получены. Возникает вопрос, как все-таки определять, например, по экспериментальным данным, соответственно, параметры, ну, например, характеристики вот, модуль Юнга. И вторая задача, э, так скажем, э, Прямая, если мы будем знать характеристики, как определять, соответственно, сдвиги частот. Чтобы решать эту задачу, возникает такая дилемма. С одной стороны, формулы и модели должны быть достаточно простые, и с другой стороны, они должны давать приемлемую точность, хотя бы инженерную точность, так скажем, которая, вот сейчас, хотя бы, которая уже сейчас было бы даже достаточно в какой-то мере, потому что разброс точность измерения достаточно низкая. Самая простая идея это такая, что если мы, конечно, рассматриваем оболочку как толстую оболочку, трехмерное тело, не как оболочку, ну, собственно говоря, как слой, да, изогнутый, круговой, то э, э, если модуль Юнга изменяется вдоль толщины, под толщине оболочки, то самое естественное это усреднить произвести интегральное такое усреднение, найти среднее интегральное этого модуля Юнга и перейти к более простой модели Киргуфа-Ляма. Уже модели оболочки, и для нее все считать. Ну и возникает сразу два вопроса. Во-первых, какую приемлемую точность дает эти такое простейшее приближение? Ну и, соответственно, как можно на этом пути выудить какую-то полезную информацию о исходной оболочке, уже трехмерной, так условно ее называть. Первое, то, что следует проверить, это, конечно, насколько точность такого рода подхода, она обеспечивает ну, вот, значит, для наших всех вычислений. Поэтому сначала была просто нами рассмотрен простейший вариант, двухслойная оболочка, высочно-постоянная. То есть вот если мы имеем толщину оболочки здесь отложена, внутренний слой ослаблен два раза, внутренний еще не подвержен коррозии. Вот. И, соответственно, усредненное значение модуля упругости вычисляется по такой формуле. Это, значит, этот модуль упругости является функцией относительной толщины слоев H1,2, который здесь регулирует, это просто, вот, грубо говоря, отношение вот этой толщины внутреннего, так сказать, испорченного слоя ко всей толщине оболочки. Ну вот различные кривые отвечают различным, соответственно, значениям, соответственно, кривая изменяется с изменением толщины, а E1,2 это вот отношение вот этой высоты в ступеньке первой ко второй. Ну вот простейшая совершенно модель. И затем мы просто сравнили то, что это было необходимо. Эту модель, во-первых, мы сосчитали точно, используя АКСИС программу, то есть как трехмерное тело. Затем с усредненным модулем упругости и опять-таки с помощью программы АКСИС были получены результаты. Но ну, а затем была использована модель Киркопа. 
уже с усредненным модулем упругости. И были, было интересно посмотреть, насколько это все совпадает. Ну, я сразу отмечаю еще раз, что мы рассматриваем крутильные, чисто крутильные, как колебания оболочки, жестко закрепленные на концах. Ну, здесь указаны те начальные данные материала, которые используются. Ну, я отмечу, что мы все сразу взяли такие достаточно тяжелые случаи, как говорится, тонкостенные оболочки, достаточно она толстая, на пределе, так сказать, применимости теории тонких оболочек кибуха для... Вот, поэтому здесь мы как бы на, получаем наиболее плохие результаты, которые возможны. Ну, на следующей картинке просто отмечены, как меняется частота колебаний, собственно, частоты колебаний оболочки, первые три, собственно, частоты, это вот, в зависимости от толщины вот этого испорченного слоя H1.2. Отмечу, что все три модели, они ложатся, так сказать, зрительно неотличимы внутри значит, на эти кривые. То есть все три модели тут совпадают зрительно. Поэтому приходится рассматривать относительное изменение этих процентное, так скажем, да, отношение значит, изменения частот к частотам оболочки. То есть ну, вот, относительно погрешность, грубо говоря, одной оболочки относительно другой. Ну вот отмечено, что приблизительно это около, вот, максимально это около 0,6%, полпроцента. Вот достигается, кстати, интересно, что она примерно, когда половина слоя примерно испорчена. Значит, ну вот это первый такой результат простейший, конечно. Ну вот ансис, собственно говоря, считался, вот, опять-таки, контроль первой, вторая, третья формы. Но это естественно, значит, все понятно, значит, как это коллекция. Затем также также значит, были проведены сравнения внутри всех частот. То есть видно, что с ростом номера частоты, то есть с ростом номера экспрессионной ветки, ну, погрешность нарастает, но не столь значительно. При этом вот относительная погрешность, которая отвечает оболочке Киркова, не столь значительно хуже, чем, например, относительная погрешность для модели Ансиса, но с усредненной оболочкой. То есть ну, практически одно и то же. Теперь возникает вопрос. Хорошо, вот мы определим на таком пути, вроде бы модель неплохо работает, ну, надо сказать, там были проведены еще целый ряд вычислений, которые как бы, значит, нам были полезны для установления соответствия. Но возникает вопрос, как мы будем потом мерить частоты, как это наиболее разумно делать. Ну вот была, возникла такая идея, что вот давайте присоединим, так сказать, такой узкий поясок, массовый, ну фактически нулевой толщины, да, так если бы сказать, идеализированно, и будем смотреть, собственно, частоты вот этой вспомогательной задачи. Ну, а, соответственно, вот можно сосчитать и с помощью Ансиса эти частоты, и с помощью программы Киркофа. Ну и здесь вполне понятная ситуация. Если поясок посередине, то все нечетные формы, антисимметричные относительно начала, они вообще не чувствуют этого массы, потому что там у них узел, где находится эта масса. Это вот синие линии, они не зависят от величины массы. Ну а красные линии, это там, где как раз спреск находится, приходится на этот поясок. Видно, что, конечно, с ростом массы частота падает, но все-таки не ниже ближайшей вот частоты для условно антисимметричных. Но интересно то, что когда мы работаем в окрестности вот этой частоты, например, если масса у нас порядка там, ну, единицы, предположим, то частоты и первой, и второй моды очень близки. Поэтому легко достаточно контролировать такой сорт частоты, потому что ну, происходит перескок с одной формы на другую, и такую частоту достаточно легко идентифицировать. Во всяком случае, ну, на фоне того плотного спектра частот оболочки, ну вот это сделать хотя бы уже представляется несколько более простой задачей. Ну и опять-таки для этого грузика были рассчитаны относительные погрешности, они не намного больше. Вот здесь вот масса 0,2 означает, что масса грузика примерно в 5 раз меньше, чем масса оболочки без грузика. Вот. Ну видно, что вот здесь погрешность порядка 0,65%, ну а без грузика, вот напомню, было порядка 0,44%, ну, в общем, несущественно. 
Ну вот когда мы убедились в, этой, в том, что это как будто бы неплохо работает, разумеется, это такой, так скажем, инженерный подход к установлению как бы, применимости метода. Но тем не менее мы получаем конкретные числа, в отличие, например, от асимптотических методов, которые, конечно, дают какие-то асимптотические поправки, но не дают, так сказать, вот выхода на реальные цифры. А все-таки нам нужны как бы вот конкретно было бы посмотреть, насколько меняются числа. Так вот, теперь переходим к непрерывной зависимости параметров оболочки от толщины. Ну вот здесь была предложена некая модель, ну, физически достаточно разумная, так скажем, на первый взгляд. Ну, конечно, это надо проверять экспериментально, для каких режимов это выполняется и так далее, но тем не менее. Ну вот водород экспоненциально проникает в длину оболочки. То есть при этом, соответственно, ослабляется коэффициент модуль Юнга. Ну вот по такой кривой. Ну такая кривая имеет два характерных параметра. Это двухпрометрическое семейство. Это Е2, это, грубо говоря, вот, модуль упругости внешнего слоя. Ну а Е1,2, вот параметр безразмерный, это отношение жесткостей испорченного и сказать, целого слоя. Ну а параметр А – это коэффициент затухания. Так вот, теперь, коли у нас есть здесь два параметра, то, значит, соответственно, можно проинтегрировать. Теперь мы как бы считаем, что мы проверили в какой-то степени то, что эта формула интегрирования хорошо работает на высочно-постоянных функциях. И вот, соответственно, вот на такой сложной тогда кривой сравнительно, да, мы получаем средний модуль упругости вот по этой форме. Вот соответствующие кривые для различных параметров B описывают поведение вот этого средневного модуля упругости. Ну и теперь далее возникает, конечно, понятная задача. Теперь у нас оболочка Гергофа, мы с ней работаем, а не с оболочкой упругой трехмерной. Здесь все просто. Здесь у нас частота входит только в один параметр безразмерный. Вот безразмерная частота. Вот. Где, соответственно, она фигурирует вместе с модулем упругости Е. Ну и поэтому, если у нас происходит сдвиг частот, ну, например, если мы сравним исходную, как бы неиспорченную оболочку, вот эту подпорченную, то отношение частот, которые будут наблюдаться, будет как раз равно корню квадратному из отношения средних, вот этих усредненного, точнее, усредненной упругости и исходной, э, исходного модуля упругости. И вот эта связь, собственно говоря, и позволяет нам работать в обе стороны. Если мы знаем сдвиг частот, и мы каким-то образом знаем, да, вот, да, если мы знаем этот сдвиг частот, то мы, соответственно, знаем вот и усредненную, соответственно, усредненную модуль провести и наоборот. Ну вот на этом пути, например, если мы опять-таки возвращаемся уже к этой экспоненциальной зависимости по глубине проникновения водорода, на этом пути мы, соответственно, получаем вот такое уравнение, которое как раз связывает коэффициент затухания и сдвиг частот. Ну и, соответственно, если мы знаем либо левую, либо, так скажем, правую часть, да, то мы, чисто на это элементарно решается, мы находим, соответственно, параметры затухания оболочки. Вот, зная сдвиг частот, ну и наоборот, зная затухание, мы сможем определить сдвиг частот со временем. Также, также можно использовать следующее обстоятельство. Дело в том, что все эти процессы проникновения водорода в металл, они, конечно, зависят от времени. Если в начальный момент времени все было хорошо, потом по прошествии некоторого времени, значит, соответственно, все больше и больше упругие свойства меняются. Ну и тут тоже неплохо бы иметь какие-то оценки, как со временем меняются вот эти частоты. Частоты. Ну, здесь опять-таки нужна некая элементарная модель. Повторяю, что модели могут быть различные. Это должны, собственно говоря, кстати, тщательный анализ экспериментальных данных и режимы, при которых режим и анализ режимов охрупчивания, когда все происходит, чтобы установить, какие именно модели поведения функции нам надо исследовать. Но смысл в любом случае понятен. Значит, мы главное 
данном случае, чтобы, конечно, тут параметров было немного, таких неопределенных, которые нам надо предстоит определять. Ну, в экспоненциальном случае там два параметра. Хорошо, вот возвращаясь к зависимости от времени. Соответственно, вот здесь предлагается опять-таки экспоненциальная модель в зависимости от времени охлопчивания. То есть, если у нас было некое исходное состояние Е2, не испорченной оболочки, то спустя, то со временем оно экспоненциально, так сказать, ее модуль ухудшается и достигает некоторого предельного значения вот этой экспоненциальной музыки. Ну, опять-таки, предельное значение – это вопрос исследования, определения, но, во всяком случае, это можно все мерить на поверхности, хотя бы не залезая в Ну, соответственно, опять-таки, если мы на предыдущем этапе определили затухание коэффициент по глубине, то теперь, используя выражение, вводя вот эту гипотезу зависимости от времени, мы получаем связь уже в зависимости коэффициента затухания от времени со сдвигом частот. И, соответственно, если мы знаем сдвиг частот, мы сможем определить вот это безразмерное время в ТТ и, соответственно, коэффициент затухания. Ну и наоборот, задав время, вот, мы сможем определить и сдвиг частот со временем. Ну, почему это может быть важно, этот сдвиг частот? Ну, хотя бы потому, что э, конструкция может выйти со временем на собственное колебание с такой частотой, которые не были для нее предна... изначально предназначены. То есть это может быть режим, ну, грубо говоря, близкий к разрушению или хотя бы к износу. Поэтому актуальность этого, вот, мне кажется, такая, достаточно очевидна. Вот. Таким образом, вот на этом пути, да, да, ну вот, собственно говоря, вот это я и рассказал, вот, сказать, вот эти основные идеи. Теперь, ну, заключение. Ну, заключение, что можно сказать, добавлю к тому, что я сказал уже, ну, что, конечно, здесь этот подход, этот подход имеет с нашей точки зрения вполне осмысленный такой э, смысл, значит, значит все деятельность весьма осмысленная. Вот, конечно, нужно больше экспериментальных данных, чтобы иметь больше типовых зависимостей по толщине оболочки. Но, тем не менее, сам факт того, что из, изучая различные режимы колебаний, ну, в данном случае крутильные, а можно еще рассматривать другие там осисимметричные колебания, достаточно простые, на которых можно легко отслеживать сдвиги частот и, соответственно, восстанавливать параметры оболочки и, соответственно, параметры просто вот поведения модуля упругости по толщине оболочки. Ну вот, здесь, думаю, вот на это главное. Ну, а, видимо, остальные все факты, которые здесь перечислены, я уже сказал, потому что я повторяться не буду. Ну, может быть, наверное, это основное, так что спасибо за внимание. Спасибо. Какие есть вопросы у аудитории? Вопросы, комментарии, пожалуйста. Если нет вопросов, еще раз поблагодарим докладчика. Спасибо. Спасибо. Да, вот эти. Аплодисменты очень уместны. Спасибо. Спасибо. Следующий у нас Николай Павлович Ярошенко. Ярошевич, прошу прощения. Ой. Пожалуйста, вы здесь, Николай Павлович? Да, да, я есть. Есть, есть, Александр Глевович. Я... Да, а коллег... Предыдущий докладчик вот должен выйти из... Да, да. Секунду. Все, кажется, вышел. Да, нет еще. Вот теперь вышел. Политех, зал мы видим. Пожалуйста. Секунду, а что что да, не получается? Демонстрацию экрана я включаю. Так. 
Ну, вроде включается. А, совместное использование, да? Совместное использование, наверное. Так, что-то. Вот это ваш экран. Так, нажать на ту презентацию, которую вы хотите показать. Да, вроде не получилось, да, у меня это сделать. Ну, непонятно, секундочку. Еще раз ее открыть, да. Она открыта у меня на столе. То есть вы ее видите, а мы ее не видим. Не, я уже ее тоже Давайте вижу. я вам объясню. А, у вас на рабочем столе должна быть открыта ваша презентация. Да, она открыта у меня на рабочем столе. Нажимайте на экране Zoom зеленую кнопку демонстрации экрана. Ну вот так меня сейчас нет. Его... Выведите экран Zoom. Он у вас, скорее всего, свернут в правом верхнем углу находится. Зум, здесь экран. Нет, нет. Вы видите, где внизу на ярлыках камера? Одну зум. секундочку, я... Камеру выключим. Камеру выключу. Выключим а экран. Она открыта у тебя? Она открыта. Вот это? Не, вот. Нет, это не он. Вот это? Нет. Это открою я. Это не... А вот он. Так, все, я с ним использую. Демонстрации. А, видно, да, вот все правильно теперь. Да, И открывайте видно. показ да, слайдов. Чуть-чуть просто... не нажал. Показ слайдов. Наверху, в верхнем ну, меню. Да, да, я вижу, можно начинать, да? Показ да, пожалуйста, слайдов Александр. и сначала. У вас тогда откроется на полный экран. Не понял, опять ничего. Нет, на полный экран, ну, как, если хотите, можете открывать лучше. Но если держите, уже видно, на самом деле. Вот это, вот это закрыт крестик. Так, где вы масштаб больше? Нет, это забавно. Внизу есть рюмочка, еще можно на нее вот нажать. Он, да? Так нормально? Да, но я не вижу, как листать тогда. Вот, вот этими? А вот этими. Да. Александр Львович, видно хорошо? Ви видно, ну, э, хорошо, хорошо. Вот так. Я боюсь, можно что... Можно начинать. Пожалуйста, начинайте. Да. Медленные колебания в приводах, вибрационных машинах с инновационными виборазбудителями. Но я хочу сказать, что вот эти материалы я обсуждал с Изюлей Израилевичем еще в январе этого года. Вот так получилось. Проблема прохождения зоны резонанса неуновешенным ротором достаточно важна для гибротехники. Что-то я переехал, да? К настоящему времени она хорошо изучена. Это, этой проблеме определено достаточного внимания в работах Блехмана. Например, 1.3. Внизу литература. В них, в частности, обращается внимание на наличие в области эффекта Замерфельда быстрых, медленных и полумедленных движений. Настоящая работа посвящена некоторому дополнению результатов статьи Блехмана Индейцева Фроткова. Медленные движения в системах с инновационным возбуждением колебаний. Расчетная схема РИС-1 соответствует простейшему и случаю, когда колебательная часть системы линейная и имеет одну степень свободы. Данная модель является одной из базовых моделей теории систем с ограниченным возбуждением, но без учета упора демпфирующего соединения ротовов электродвигателя и виборазбудителя. Заметим, что такое соединение может быть представлено ременной передачей, кавданным валом или каким-либо другим деформируемым звеном. Пусть для краткости это будет муфта. Уравнение движения системы имеет вид 1-2. Используя метод прямого разделения движения, 
приходим к вовнениям медленных движений от его в двигателя и вибровозбудителя. Ну, В — это вибрационный момент. Передвигаемся, да? Выражение при анализе уравнений медленного движения весьма важен характер изменения вибрационного момента. Выражение для вибрационного момента, вот мы представили в таком виде, в виде 5, обратим внимание, оно свидетельствует как о существенном, так и о стремительном, скачкообразном увеличении вибрационного момента в зоне резонанса, но пропорционально квадрату коэффициента динамичности колебаний несущей системы. Волнение медленных движений вибровозбудителя вот всем не отличается от полученного профессором Блехмана для базовой динамической модели, следовательно, Выводы, сделанные им относительно возможных стационарных режимов и их устойчивости, справедливы также для рассматриваемой модели. Но это имеется в виду, что в рассматриваем приближение. Здесь у нас статья с Ильей Израилевичем, где показано, что упогодимфирующее соединение может изменять вибрационный момент. Но сейчас это мы... На этом не будем останавливаться. Естественно, наличие упуга демпфирующего элемента не влияет на медленные движения. Этого нельзя утверждать о быстрых движениях системы. Это уравнение 8. И ставим уравнение колебаний вибровозбудителя, вот второе 8, вот в таком виде. Как видим, это уравнение принимает вид в уравнениях малых вынужденных колебаний относительно положения устойчивого равновесия. Коэффициент С пси можно назвать условным коэффициентом жесткости. Его величина в зоне резонанса несущей системы становится существенной. Э пси член вот представляет частоту свободных поворотных колебаний. В работах Блехмана – Ротова, не уновешенного ротова. В работах Блехмана эту частоту названо, еще называют частотой свободных колебаний внутреннего маятника. В работах Фроткова ее названо также частотой Блехмана. С учетом того, что эффект Замерфельда возникает при скачкообразном увеличении вибрационного момента и пренебрегая при сопротивлением в 9 решение этого уравнения вот мы представляем в таком виде о колебаниях этого лучше всего судить о колебания по колебаниях его скорости и вот приходим к такому выражению 11 следовательно при установлении стационарного режима в области эффекта замерфельда имеет место явно выраженный переходной процесс представляющие собой затухающие колебания скорости вибровозбудителя с медленной частотой пепси. Максимальные амплитуды колебаний достаточно велики. В крайней мере они втрое выше амплитуд устанавливающего впоследствии стационарного режима. Возникновение медленных колебаний является следствием скачкообразного увеличения вибрационного момента в зоне резонанса. Колебания скорости вибровозбудителя могут быть причиной повышенных колебаний привода. Уравнение колебаний, которые вот представили мы в таком виде, решение этого уравнения 13. Позволяет оценить колебания привода либо машины в случае возникновения эффекта Замерфельда. Она свидетельствует, что колебания мягкого привода либо машины при медленном прохождении ее зоны резонанса будут достаточно большими. 
Видно, что можно проанализировать основными колебаниями привода либо машины является все-таки его быстрые колебания с частотой 2 омега. Результаты компьютерного моделирования вот хорошо подтверждают приведенные выводы с помощью полученных методов прямого разделения движения. Тут хорошо видно, что мы имеем явно выраженный переходной процесс. Здесь это колебания скорости этого вибровозбудителя. Здесь приведены колебания в приводе, привода в случае жесткого и мягкого привода. В случае мягкого они имеют вот такой резонансный характер. Выводы. При застревании частоты электродвигателя в зоне резонанса вибромашины возбуждается бигармонические затухающие колебания скорости вибровозбудителя с основными большими амплитудами. Эти колебания представляют собой переходной процесс к стационарному режиму вращения вибровозбудителя в области эффекта Замерфельда. При возникновении эффекта Замерфельда колебания мягкого привода вибрационной машины с инновационным возбуждением будут большими. Критическими частотами привода наряду с его собственной частотой, платными частотами, можно считать также частоту застревания электрического двигателя в зоне резонанса вибромашины Омега, ну, приближенно собственную частоту несущей системы, двойную частоту застревания, а также частоту медленных колебаний скорости вибровозбудителя ПЭПСИ в области эффекта. Благодарю за внимание. Пожалуйста, вопросы. Пожалуйста, вопросы. Я знаю, что эта тематика Илью Израильевича интересовала действительно последние годы и распространение вот результатов из нашей статьи с Дмитрием Анатольевичем Индейцевым, с ним на системы с многими степенями свободы. Это была одна из тех задач, которые он решал в последние годы. Здесь как раз она и рассматривается. Александр Львович, позволите вопрос? Вопрос, конечно, пожалуйста. Да. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот эти колебания, медленные колебания ротора, они у вас возникают из-за податливости соединения двигателя с э, дебалансом? Нет, да. они есть всегда. Что? Они в зоне резонанса возбуждаются всегда. Вот я как раз хотел и понять. В зоне резонанса, независимо от да. жесткости привода... Вот они... в статье Блехмана, Индейцева и Александра Львовича там нету, не учитывается упрыгость привода, а да, они да. показывают эти колебания. Я только немножко дополнил, показал, что это переходной процесс, что в случае привода, мягкий привод намного хуже, если мы, у нас зависла частота, ротов не разогнался, то последствия для мягкого привода намного хуже. Вот это только я подчеркнул. А все это показал Блехман. Вот Спасибо. Они есть всегда, будут. Если уже зависы от этого, они возникают. Еще вопросы, пожалуйста. Так, ну что ж, вопросов больше нету. Спасибо еще раз докладчику. Очень интересный доклад.